Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now I now call to order the special work session of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 26, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mr. Mahomza, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved on the October 13, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely. Subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names when making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Before we continue, I do have some additional information. First, on January 19th, 2021, the board approved to resume fall high school sports on February 13th, 2021. I have been advised that this motion is contrary to the county executive's order of 2021-01, which was issued January 7th of 2021 and is effective until February 28th, 2021. The executive order states that outdoor social gatherings of more than 25 people are prohibited. This includes non-professional sports gatherings and ex events. Therefore, the school system is unable to implement this. When the executive order is amended, the board will revisit this motion. Second, at our January 5th meeting, the board unanimously approved adding reopening of schools as a standing first item of unfinished business on all subsequent open session agendas until all schools have fully reopened to all students for full-time in-person instruction. When tonight's work session was rescheduled from the board's January 19th, 2021 meeting, and when this agenda was created, its sole purpose was to address budget questions. There were no other items of business on the agenda, and this issue was not addressed on the 19th. So what I would like to know is, does the board wish to, um, does the board wish this item of school reopening to be added to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair, point of order. Yes, is that Ms. Hen? Thank you. Yes, Ms. Hen. As the board has already voted to add the reopening of schools as a stand, the standing first item of unfinished business to all open session um, agendas until all schools have fully reopened, then this item should have been added to the agenda as this is an open session. So in that, um, that was the direction provided by the board um, that has been given and per the advice of legal counsel, it should be added. Okay, so then with that being the case and that we can add it, I would then ask uh, Ms. Gober if you could add them after add it to item C. Okay. All right. Ms. Gober, are you there? Yes, ma'am. It has been added. Thank you so much. Madam okay. Chair, excuse me. So we can um, then go on. I guess we're going to go ahead to the 2020 operating budget uh, work session. So per the motion that passed at the January 19, 2021 board meeting, tonight's meeting is scheduled as a designated work session on the superintendent's proposed FY 2022 operating budget. 
At this time, I call on Dr. Scriven, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Tantliff. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Superintendent Williams, Vice Chair Hen, members of the board. This evening we are gathered and we want to first uh, thank you for your flexibility uh, with uh, working with us and uh, allowing us to uh, bring uh, a budget to your attention that is as close to uh, what we have ultimately uh, presented in the past. Uh, in terms of, of meeting that directive, uh, we are here tonight uh, to discuss two divisions with you. Uh, we will start with schools and then we will also uh, present uh, business services. Uh, in addition uh, to those two divisions, uh, we are prepared to uh, provide any additional clarity needed to uh, questions uh, that have been uh, submitted uh, for our responses, uh, which have been posted uh, and filled any additional questions which we may or may not be able uh, to answer uh, this evening. If we were if we are unable to, we will definitely uh, do our due diligence. Uh, to find the appropriate responses. Uh, I'm joined this evening with uh, by Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantliff, who uh, will be uh, taking us through a presentation uh, to go over the FY proposed uh, 2022 budget and then to go over uh, the division update for schools and the budgetary division update for business services. So uh, at this time, I will yield the floor uh, to Mr. Saris. Uh, Mr. Saris, if you can uh, please take over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scriven. Uh, the superintendent has uh, asked us to present uh, a brief introduction to lend some structure to the overall discussion. Um, and we have a, a, a small PowerPoint that I will uh, Scam, skim through uh, to to give you a sense of what you'll uh, what will be presented tonight. So uh, the next slide two is a uh, Mr. Tanliff. Could you advance one, please, to slide two? <clears throat> OK, um, I don't see it yet. Should I? Uh... Um, hold on. Sorry, George, one second. It's not okay. showing up a slideshow. It looks like it should be. Okay. Give me 10 seconds. I apologize. Still can't see it. Uh, I can see it in the margins, but I can't see it in the main frame. Yeah, Jim. Mr. Saris, I'm going to um, jump in and grab the slideshow to um, uh, help out here. So give me one second. I'm going to run, OK? OK. OK, this is Ms. Scott. So what we're doing is, is we're waiting for the slideshow so that we can review along with Mr. Saris. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So I see the cover sheet. Next slide. Uh, good. There we are. Thanks, Jim. So this is a, a summary of the county, state, and federal revenues that comprise the budget. And you'll see that 
Uh, we are asking for 5.1 percent over maintenance of effort from the county and uh, we have assumed uh, previously that the state uh, and county would both hold us harmless at revenue levels for FY21 the current year. We have already heard uh, in the governor's proposed budget that there is a home hold harmless provision and so that uh, will provide uh, 20 million dollars in state revenue that was uh, that would have otherwise uh, been lost uh, due to the declining enrollment. Uh, we will uh, wait to hear from county government. Uh, they are about 23 million dollars uh, below maintenance of effort based on enrollment. And with this additional 16.3 million request, we are at just under $40 million in additional revenue we're requesting from the county. Uh, and the other funds are uh, miscellaneous revenues uh, in the general fund, the largest piece of which is $30 million in reappropriated fund balance. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this slide and the next slide are both just here as uh, as an illustration of the the minimum requirements that we are required to present on or before March 1st to the county government. So this would be the revenue summary for all uh, funds and the next slide would be the uh, if you would advance Mr. Corns. The next slide are the 13 appropriations for the general fund that comprise the budget. So I know that in a previous meeting we talked about uh, the very minimum requirements for a budget due uh, on or before March 1st and basically these two sheets represent that. Um, could we go to the next slide, Mr. Corns? I think uh, the school's budget and um, I'm going to give you a brief overview. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, the school's budget consists almost entirely of salaries and wages and the other categories listed there are the discretionary budgets that each principal is allocated based on their enrollment. Uh, and we'll uh, talk some more about that um, in the next slide. Um, could we move on? Thanks. Uh, we did want to uh, summarize uh, some of the work that has been done this year, some of the essential work and enhancements that our uh, community superintendents and school administrators have uh, focused on uh, in this year. Um, as Dr. Williams reminds us that uh, instruction is based on highly qualified teachers and leaders in every building. And in addition to that, uh, he set forth a goal for us uh, to preserve and protect school budgets and staffing ratios. And that's uh, an important premise on which the budget was built and uh, a different approach than we took with non-instructional uh, expenses. Um, and there, some of the enhancements that have been added to our schools uh, as a result of uh, coping with the pandemic have included um, additional PPE and um, re-engagement programs that took place over the summer, uh, the additional instructional materials and tutoring that we were able to provide throughout the fall as a result of the care, uh, CRF tutoring grant, and finally a, an, a, an equity review of EDA allocations. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just our staffing ratio. It's it's one of the pages in the initial document. 
um, I believe. And uh, just to indicate here that none of those ratios changed and that um, despite uh, the loss of enrollment this year, we're adequately staffed. Uh, next slide, please. And the same is true here that we have uh, preserved school budgets by preserving the per pupil funding, which when uh, combined with enrollment, uh, generates the school budgets that each principal is allocated. And those uh, funding levels have also been preserved. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, a more uh, focused uh, summary of what uh, comprises the school budgets. And you can see that uh, that largest section is are the per pupil amounts. And then uh, there are additional allocations for magnet schools and uh, magnet allocations from the magnet office. Uh, extended day and year learning, uh, tr the transition grant uh, and other school programs. So there's a formula that we follow that uh, provides this roughly $15 million uh, to the schools. Uh, next is business services and uh, just wanted uh, to, to review basically what we do. Um, the uh, Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning is responsible for the, the planning and design, construction and maintenance of all our facilities. They have an energy management program. They're respon primarily responsible for the capital budget and now long-term planning and they provide logistical support uh, through warehouse and distribution. Business services operation uh, is comprised of food and nutrition services and uh, student transportation. Information technology uh, manages our network and tele uh, communications infrastructure, the student information system and all enterprise applications. Uh, and fiscal services includes budget, uh, operating budget, accounting, financial reporting, cash management, payroll and purchasing, and administrative services provides our enterprise resource system management and directs the continuity of operations planning. Next slide, please. And here it is. Uh, a, a breakdown of the entire division's budget and I will uh, jump right to the uh, the purple and the red because that is a question often that we talk about in our work sessions. Uh, other charges consists uh, primarily of three things about 77 million dollars in FICA and Medicare which is all uh, budgeted in the payroll office uh, as well as uh, about $30 million in utilities and a, uh, a, a network infrastructure lease. Uh, contracted services includes um, all of the, uh, the vendors that provide equipment and uh, technology systems maintenance. All of our device leases are in this section and all of our uh, communications and software licensing fees are here. Uh, next slide, please. And I just want to go through uh, some of the efficiencies and realignments that we have undertaken. Uh, facilities has integrated strategic planning as an office within itself. They've uh, stood up automated maintenance systems and developed a sustainability program and they've accelerated the construction and relocation of three elementary schools to uh, improve capacity and they've completed a ventilation inspection and repairs at all schools 
uh, in advance of school reopening. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, efficiencies achieved by food and nutrition are obviously the uh, heroic efforts in providing almost 2.1 million meals during the pandemic. Um, and they are prepared for school reopening and to further expand um, meals uh, delivery to even more students once we reopen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Department of Information Technology. They have optimized bandwidth by uh, managing network traffic, uh, provided more self-service functions uh, to um, relieve the, uh, the technical support systems, uh, implemented lots of cloud-based offsite hosted systems, including student information, and uh, migrated all devices to a mobile management platform. Um, and in fiscal services on the next slide, um, I can tell you that we've uh, completed the software upgrades that will allow us to provide electronic procurements, uh, automated ACH vendor payments, and improved P-card management. Uh, we're planning an automated employment verification system, and we have moved to an, uh, our own hosted online catalog for school supplies, as well as expenditure tracking. And our last slide is for administrative services uh, that has restored uh, the data and our enterprise resource planning system since the uh, cyber attack uh, and managed our continuity of operations planning as well as uh, working with professional development on non-certificated professional development. And uh, having gone quickly through that, uh, we're certainly happy to answer any questions about this presentation or the budget materials that the board has. Thank you for that, Mr. Saris. Um, so I guess so that's the end of your presentation. So I guess now um, if any board members have any questions, um, please let me know. Oh yes, Mr. Kuhn. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, Mr. Kuhn. Uh, I'm trying to um, monitor this. Looks like Ms. Pastor first and then Mr. Kuhn. Okay. Thank you, um, Ms. Scott. And mine will be quick. Mine is, um, I guess, to Dr. Williams more, um, and I appreciate this, Dr. Williams. Um, when we're looking at um, teacher to student ratio um, and, and people see larger classes than the ratio would. You're muted, Ms. Pastor. <laughs> Thank you. Can we start that time again? That with Dr. Williams to you, when we are looking at teacher to student ratio, that we are looking at the teaching staff within the school. And that sort of belies sometimes what we see in our math, English, and our core classes, which seem to be larger. Um, but we know that that number and when we're looking at the staff we're incorporating electives and specials and in magnet programs those teachers and that's why sometimes other classes seem to balloon i would appreciate it and so we see a discrepancy i would really appreciate it if you would just address in light of what we're seeing in this budget in terms of what looks like a decrease because I am worried about our staffing and our supporting our, our teachers. So Ms. Dr. Williams, would you please address your thoughts, including um, how you're going to use the CARES Act and other grants and funding sources to make sure that those special programs, particularly programs like IB and um, AVID are going to be more than adequately covered and that 
our, our, our students who are going to need extra supports are also going to be covered. So what is your thinking? Because clearly this budget as it looks won't work. Thank you. So thank you, Ms. Pastor. Uh, if you recall last year um, when I came to the board with my proposed budget, I put in staffing to address enrollment. I wanted to re-examine our Title I and focus schools ratio. And then I always look at our special ed program support and ESOL program support. And as you well know, um, those items were not funded. And actually, we had to take some current positions and put them back in the classrooms. We had to do some creative scheduling, um, which I'm so appreciative of our partners and our central office that we have to really work on that. So the commitment uh, then uh, was to express just our needs, but the funding just wasn't there. And based on um, just what we're seeing now, the funding, um, as you see, I provided a small increase from the maintenance of effort, really targeting um, compensation for our staff. Um, I really feel that at this point that um, we should continue to ask for additional staffing. Um, <clears throat> I really want to look at those classrooms, particularly where our students may need additional support, such as I described the Title I. And when I say focused schools, those schools that last year, those schools that weren't identified as Title I, but close in terms of uh, their free and reduced meals ratio. So, and of course, special ed in, in, in our English language. So, um, we will continue to look at our staffing. We will continue to support our programs. You, 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 you had another question there about the AVID and MAGNET programs. Um, we will continue to provide that kind of support. Um, we've seen um, success, um, even hearing from our staff and students who are part of our AVID or special programs. And how do we continue to do that, especially if it's funded by a grant that may um, end in a year or two, we would have to look at how we will then put that in our budget uh, just to sustain those programs. Um, and there was another part you asked. Oh, in terms of the, the CARES Act, um, as I mentioned before, as we're looking at um, our reopening plan, we had success um, last spring and summer, late spring and summer, we had re-engagement programs where schools got to do, um, uh, they had to be very creative about really reaching out to those students who may have not been engaged for, for a variety of reasons. We want to continue to use funds to provide those opportunities for our schools as we're moving into second semester, um, whether it's during the day, whether it's a weekend, looking at our summer program, we are we are really trying to develop what that may look like that will extend potentially the school year for our, our, our learners and opportunities to be engaged. And again, I'm gonna focus on English language and mathematics. So I think to your point, um, as I reported when I shared the initial, my proposed budget, um, at the time, we I just saw the reality of, um, didn't see how we could then have the funding to support what I wanted to do a year ago, which I thought was pretty aggressive, but it was really showing the needs. Now we just have to figure out what we can do each year to try to address these uh, these needs with the financial support that that we get. So uh, I believe in staffing. I believe in our professional development. That's key. Um, and the team and I were working on an overview of our systemic professional development because once you become a part of Team BCPS, we want to make sure you have the tools and resources to be successful. And then if, even if you have aspirations to um, move into a different position or a different field. 
Uh, again, built business services uh, has started some great work around that. And of course, on the instruction side, um, whether folks want to go back to school, whether folks want to get their certification, whether they want to go from a classroom teacher to a system principal or principal, uh, we, 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 we like to build within and we like to build th that pool. Um, so it's a lot of a lot in that response. Um, but but again, I, I think it's worthy to say we, we, we really have to tackle the staffing and make sure we have our schools well staffed and is well staffed with highly qualified staff members. That includes teachers, our parents, um, looking at our counselors, um, you name it, is to make sure we have uh, highly qualified staff in all buildings, in all classrooms, as well as strong instructional leaders. And that will start this year, right? With this fiscal, with this budget, you're going to start nailing and making sure that it's not just by the numbers, but it's by the reality and the need. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, each, each each year we learn, or I learn more and more um, about um, our programs and working with the incredible staff that can provide that historical perspective. So, you know, I don't know what June may bring, but I really feel that we have to focus on that professional learning, you know, and it'll be great to get additional staff to look at our uh, our ratios, our, our, our special programs. We're going to continue to look at that, but I also want to look at and make sure we have a systemic overall professional learning plan. So if ever question, we can say, here's our plan. And it's tied to, I always got put in a plug, it's tied to our new strategic plan, the Compass, our Pathway to Excellence, uh, really around that focus area three about the human capital. Thank you for Thank that, you. Dr. Williams. Thank you. Okay, next we have Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you, Ms. Scott. Mr. Saris, um, I would like you to explain the comment you made about $30 million being reappropriated reappropriated from our fund balance. Can you explain that? Yes, that's something that we've done historically. It comprises the largest single item under other revenue and uh, our fund balance reverts to county government uh, at the end of each fiscal year. We have no independent control over it and the county government has uh, consistently used those funds as uh, current revenue in the following year. And so that um, is something that we have included here uh, because of its uh, consistent use in that manner over decades. So just to follow on, um, I, I, I think I do recall this, but I thought it was around $10 million last year. Is that accurate? I think it was about the same $30 million last year. Um, 31.3 both years. Okay, great. Um, I guess my next follow on question is um, revenue that we don't spend, and I would expect it to be higher than that this year. Uh, would would that all be or would we attempt to repurpose all of that money into next year's budget? Uh, we will it will it will go into the fund balance and uh, we be, because this is ultimately a, a county decision, uh, we have just anticipated using at least the same amount uh, as we did uh, this year, but I would say over the past five years, it has gradually increased. Uh, I can remember when it was 13 million and 20 million and 25 million. It's currently, as Mr. Tantliff said, 31.3. So that'll be a decision that follows uh, the board's uh, adoption of a budget. OK, thank you. Uh, just to follow up, I'm limited on time. Page 38 talks about the executive director of information technology, and I don't know if I missed this in your slides, um, but the budget 
uh, changed significantly for this group. It was $40 million last year, and it's nine, $900,000 this coming year. Can you explain that? Um, Mr. Kuhn, the, the difference uh, there is uh, one of the groups under Mr. Corns just moved to its own. Um, it doesn't roll up under Mr. Corns anymore. So uh, Ms. Obenstein, who uh, kind of does all the ordering and management of the devices, and that's where those expenses are sitting. It just broke into its own line item. So you can see the totals there are consistent. It's just on its own line. Um, and I can tell you what page if I, I can switch over to that. But you should be able to see it right on the page there. So the con I can see the contracted services is where the big change is from what I can understand here. And you're saying that that's all device related. And now where would I find that? It wouldn't be under information technology anymore? No, it is. It's just on its own line item. Let me just find the page where it's uh, listed clearly. It for looks you. like page. Uh, well, hmm. forty-three. I see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now it's it's considered technology support services. All right. Thank you. And those are the leases, the device leases. And I wanted to follow up with that because. Um, due to CARES Act funding, we went out and we bought bought a, a number of devices, correct? And right. I want to understand the breakdown of what we have that's leased and then what we own outright based on the CARES Act funding. So I'll go, if Jim is ready, I can. Yeah, Jim, why don't you go ahead and fill that one, please? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, <clears throat> we have uh, through the CARES Act, we had to outfit uh, the pre-K, uh, K one and two uh, to a one to one ratio. So many of the devices that were ordered through the CARES Act were through that um, or were purpose for that. Uh, our middle school replacement um, is uh, in the current FY21 budget. And so the remaining leases that we have are going to be on the high school PCs that we have one more year on. Uh, in addition to the Chromebook leases that we've already entered into. So just for clarification, did we purchase laptops and Chromebooks with the CARES Act money? Or do we enter into leases? No, Mr. Mr. Kuhn, we, we purchased the Chromebooks outright with the CARES Act money because it's a uh, one time. So it would have uh, it wouldn't have been um, responsible of us for to enter into a lease over that. <clears throat> so the CARES Act money was uh, used to procure or purchase outright the Chromebooks that we needed for both uh, the elementary schools as well as um, uh, in implementing them in areas like our paras and double uh, A's. OK, thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, next looks like we have Ms. Rowe. All right, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, can you hear me? We can yes. hear you. You sound quiet, but okay. yes, we can hear you. OK, um, so. My first question is, it appears from this budget because of declining enrollment that we have um, declining funding because the declining enrollment has led to fewer FTEs in the school system. But we're asking for money based on as though we had current enrollment. And what I would like to know is if we only get what the county and the state are legally obligated to give us, which would be the maintenance of effort based on the declining enrollment. What in the current budget is going to have to be shuffled around to account for the fact that we don't have that money? So, um, Ms. Rowe, this is George Saris. Uh, the yes, as you mentioned, uh, we're planning uh, 
we planned on 43 million to make up that difference. 20 from the state has been provided. Uh, we will wait to see uh, what county government can provide. Um, my uh, the most direct response I can give you is that if we were not uh, if the county were not able to provide that 23 million that uh, we have a couple options first of which would be um, to uh, be we would be unable to consider uh, increased salaries for staff or we would find a way uh, to utilize the CARES Act 2 grant in some combination to uh, uh, to preserve all of the positions and all of the services that are in this budget. OK, can you tell me besides purchasing Chromebooks, what else was the CARES Act money used for? Well, there were there were basically three grants. Um, the, there was the CARES grant, uh, the biggest use of which so far has been uh, to provide food services and sanitation uh, and hygiene um, in the schools. And we had two additional grants, the tutoring grant and the um, technology grant. Uh, both of which were about $12 million. And so all of the technology spending and much of the curriculum spending that was in our original CARES application was moved over to those two short-term grants that expired uh, December 30th. So uh, we still have um, about 17 million left on the original CARES grant and all of the technology, most of the technology ended up coming out of the separate technology grant and most of the instructional materials and professional development ended up coming out of the tutoring grant to allow us to have those remaining funds in CARES because those are two year funds and and we were directed by the state and the federal government to use up these other two grants first, and we can now carry over the remaining CARES Act Grant 1 to FY22. Okay, can you tell me in the other instructional costs, um, can you explain to me how much of those software licensing fees that you mentioned before are related to instructional materials or curriculum materials? Or is the software licensing for that in curriculum materials and curriculum instruction? Where is that money? Um, I'll let, I, I think most of the, of, of the software licensing is in the curriculum budget, a portion of it uh, might be in Mr. Korn's technology budget, but um, under enterprise applications. But Mr. Korn, do you want to correct me? Uh, sure, Mr. Sarah. So the two the two big expenditures that we have that are directly related to um, curriculum and instruction through uh, my office are um, the Schoology uh, bill. Um, for our learning management system uh, is uh, funded through the Office of Enterprise Applications as well as our SPS software, which is our special education software. And in addition, through our network support team, we also have a uh, fee for our Safari montage uh, system. Um, the There are smaller uh, uh, line items for um, uh, certain pieces of software but by and large most of the instructional material software are housed underneath of curriculum and instruction uh, with those two uh, th those three notable exceptions so and those three exceptions are under the 
other other costs? Or they're under the technology budget? The the items that Mr. Corns was was referring to were on page 45 under contracted services. Um, so if there's another page that you had in mind, Ms. Rowe, uh, let us know. Um, when we. Okay. I'll see if I can formulate a more detailed question and email it to you. Um, my last question is, I'm aware that the school system compensates for special education compensatory services and that these things are usually negotiated out in mitigation or due process hearings. And what I would like to know is last year, um, how much money did we spend for compensatory services that were not agreed to ahead of time with parents? I think Mr. Tantliff is well versed on that number. <clears throat> Let me just uh, get the total, take me just a second. I get the exact amount. Uh, Miss Rowe, we had in um, FY20 actual was just over $3 million, which is what we're planning to budget for FY22. And that three million is just as a result of mitigation and due process negotiations? Or is that the full compensatory services, including what's negotiated with parents ahead of time as part of their IEPs? Um, I, I can't answer those, uh, that particular question. Um, our non-public placement, um, which is how most of the children um, get placed, uh, we spent almost 49 million in FY20. Thank you for that. Um, next, we have Mr. Alferman. Thank you. Uh, a question. Uh, as we are, uh, when we rebuild our, uh, our various, uh, uh, various platforms, uh, and we plan for next year. Is there an increase in the amount of funds that we need to to make sure that we have superior su superior cyber security? And if we and, or and and, and and if and, and if that is necessary, uh, where where is that found in this uh, in this budget? Thank you. So I can tell you that. <clears throat> Uh, those types of costs uh, were initially provided in the uh, by our insurance coverage and that uh, those consultants have advised us to implement or to maintain that coverage and, and we have done so and uh, been able to cover that with this year's budget and it uh, I'll let Mr. Corns add to that, but we're hoping that uh, the amount of those expenses that carry over to FY22 will be uh, much less than they will than they are this year. And so, Mr. Offerman, Offerman to add to that, um, we have. Um, both um, uh, we have both uh, uh, costs that are already in our um, in our budget. We're we're examining places where we uh, can find efficiencies. Um, as an example, um, in in this uh, pandemic, we've shifted from a um, a web uh, conferencing system to one that was included in our Microsoft for a net savings. So. All monies that are underneath of particularly our, our network services uh, areas, we're realigning 
to move um, things both the cloud based as well as leveraging in a much uh, more expedited process uh, changes that had already been um, designed to go in place. So uh, from the standpoint of ongoing or reoccurring costs, uh, the the uh, changes that we've had to put in place due to our uh, uh, recent ransomware attack are, are going to be um, able to be covered underneath of the uh, current budget ask that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. If we have Dr. Hager. Hi, everyone. Um, I submitted a number of questions and I thank you for the responses that you provided in writing. Um, I do want to go back to two of those questions, though, and they're similar to ones that have been asked already. Um, numbers 35 and 36 in the uh, the way that they were numbered the, when they were responded to. And um, so one, it, so we have this maintenance of effort budget that is also uh, we're asking for 5% over, knowing that we have a re reduced enrollment and yet we're reducing our number of teaching positions by 122. And that really concerns me. And I know that we're doing that to maintain our ratios, but I would think that we would want smaller group sizes and smaller classroom sizes post pandemic when kids are coming back at different <laughs> levels. And I, I just wish I, I, I don't I still don't understand that rationale. And if someone could explain that, it would be great. And then I'll ask my other question since I know I only have two minutes. And that is related to number 36, which has to do with the special education positions. And in the budget, it says no additional special education positions are funded in the proposed budget. And uh, Dr. Williams just said in response to Ms. Pasture's question that that's a priority. So why are we not hiring more teachers and we're cutting teachers we're not hiring more teachers and we're not hiring any additional staff in special education and these are areas that again are of great concern post pandemic um so dr hey oh sorry, sorry. Let, me, let me respond to okay. dr hager then you all can take it from there what i was describing is what i proposed last year in my budget and and those line items were eliminated so you know, I saw the need not only with special ed, English language learners, um, and again, looking at Title I, but looking at the financial outlook at the time in which I presented my, my proposed budget and having a maintenance of effort, I really just focused on the compensation. And then as I shared with Ms. Pastor, looking at professional development and really beefing that up. So, so I just want to clarify that comment that that was made earlier, but um, Mr. Stanliff or Mr. Sarris, you want to take it from there? Yeah, um, I know that. Well, Wick, go ahead. No, I, all I was going to say is it was really just the situation we were faced because um, just as a reminder, all our students count this year 100% drives our revenue next year. Um, and because our decline was so severe, um, as far as what we knew when we put the budget together, our revenue could have potentially dropped tens of millions of dollars. So we are just kind of making the best of bad choices, honestly, when you're just trying to make the budget foot um, and do it in a way that impacts the students the least. So it's not at all what we would have wanted to present initially, but we thought it was the best under the circumstances. You know, as we know now, we, we know that we'll get the state revenue that we had put in the budget and hopefully we'll get the county revenue. Um, the CARES grants too avail is available now, so that may help us in that regard. But to answer your question is when we put the budget together, we were faced with um, the loss of tens of millions of dollars. So quite frankly, something has to give in that scenario. And that a little bit alarms me because the what, what gave were teachers and special educators. And I, again, I think that that is probably the most important thing post pandemic for our, for the kids is to have the, those smaller group settings and the one on one attention. Um, and so. So are you suggesting that now that the governor's made his his statement and we know additional um, funding will come that there will be an updated budget or or is this still the proposed budget budget that stands in front of us? 
Well, the budget already anticipates both the state and the county uh, coming through with uh, what we've called hold harmless funding. Um, and the Office of Strategic Planning is looking at additional enrollment possibilities for next year, but next year's funding is based on this year's enrollment under the state's funding formulas. So um, we are uh, looking to other sources of revenue, including possibly the CARES Act, that could be used, uh, for instance, let's say more students show up next year, as we expect they will, it's not realistic to reduce staffing. So that would be a situation in which we would uh, certainly uh, consider the CARES Act for the, to support those additional positions. So if it was hold harmless though, why cut 122 teacher positions? Because uh, everything was based on actual enrollment this year, and we had no projected data to work with. So being conservative, we started out here, and as you mentioned, we probably will uh, be revising these estimates and making recommendations accordingly um, going forward. And Dr. Hager, just to clarify, hold harmless, doesn't mean um, there's no impact to operations. In this regard, it means keeping funding flat to year ago, but we have benefit inflation. We're trying to fund a step increase for all of our employees. We have contract inflation. So a flat budget um, can only support those things if certain things get reduced. So um, if it had gone down tens of millions, obviously it would be a really dire situation. So keeping us hold, held harmless um, at least gets us to something we can foot and manage. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next, it looks like we have Miss Lisa Mack. Yes, um, thank you. Um, Dr. Williams has said in the past, what matters is what happens in the classroom. Since I'm in full agreement with that sentiment, I'd like to know what money is included in this budget to retain schoolhouse staff and to reward them for going above and beyond to make virtual learning at least tenable for some students and beneficial for others. I'd specifically like to know if this budget includes a COLA. I'd like confirmation that health care costs for union representative employees has increased. I'd like to confirm that teachers did not get a step in last year's budget, and I'd also like to confirm that personnel at the top of pay scales do not qualify for steps. Um, I could take that. Yeah. So the, yeah. this last year's budget, um, Dr. Williams was able to fund a 1%, this is FY21 being last year, um, all employees except for um, senior staff that's unaffiliated got a one percent call and no step in this year's budget we have proposed a step but no call up for all employees who are eligible for a step increase but people at the top of the pay scale would not be eligible is that correct um it would it, right now if they are on a step scale they would be but uh, the most senior employees are not on a scale with steps. OK, thank you for that confirmation. And I'd like to um, kind of move to where Dr. Hager was, but with a different group of employees. Ms. White had a budget that um, was trying to close the gap of school counselors, social workers and psychologists. Last year, I think Dr. Williams proposed budget also included um, an increase in those positions. Um, and I believe it's critical this year when we return to school to have wraparound services for our students who need them. What positions specifically like school counselors, social workers, school psychologists and PPWs are included in this budget? Um, well, right now, the budget you have before you does not have any 
increased positions in those areas. Um, we did get both the blueprint and state aid funding uh, this week and the concentration of poverty grant, which does have some school counselors, did increase by almost $3 million. So that would, um, and that's just came out this week, that would um, allow several more counselors to be funded by that grant. But unfortunately, as critical as they are, because of we, you know, the conversation we've had with Dr. Hager, there, there just were not funds to add more of those positions due to the enrollment situation. I guess, Mr. Tantliff, where I struggle with this is we're talking about a $1.7 billion budget. And if we don't have appropriate personnel to help our children succeed, we don't need anything else. We don't need IT, we don't need a board, we don't need a superintendent, we don't need staff. And I am concerned that we have not given adequate consideration to the importance of bodies in the schoolhouse. So Ms. Mack, uh, Daryl Williams, I just want to um, respond. <clears throat> Again, last year we put forth a very, very aggressive budget. I did as well as the board and it included 10 counselors, a recommendation for 10 counselors, social workers, psychologists, um, I believe nursing and health assistant, um, George and, and Witt, those items were not, all of those items were not funded. And so again, looking at the financial state that we were in at the time and getting a maintenance of effort for this year, um, I just moved forward with a maintenance of effort, acknowledging the staff with a, a step based on where we are or where we were back then. So I recognize that absolutely what we do when our students return as well as our staff returning, we, we do have to focus on the social emotional well-being and to commend the staff and our administrators for all the work that they have done this year to address that. So I understand your point about looking at and providing that kind of support to our students and staff. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm waiting to find out how much time I have left. 10 seconds. Um, okay, so what number of P BCPS staff receive a monthly car allowance and what is the average dollar amount of that car allowance? Has BCPS evaluated the cost savings of eliminating car allowances and moving all employees to vouchers as needed? Um, I believe, I don't know the number of positions, Ms. Mack, but I believe that the annual uh, expenditure is approximately $200,000 for those stipends. It's in that area, George, I'd have to double check it. Okay, thank you. Can that um, information be followed up and sent an email perhaps to Ms. Mack? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you. Next we have Mr. Mahomza. Yes, good evening. Um, Mr. Tentland, uh, my first question, I don't know if you already would answer it or another session that maybe could answer it, but um, the uh, ratio of uh, the one uh, counselor per 350 students for high school and middle school, um, how does that compare to um, the recommendations from national organizations across the state and how does that also compare to other jurisdictions? Did you, I, I had trouble hearing you. Were you asking how does our actual ratio of counselors compare to other LEAs and jurisdictions? Yes, and the recommendations um, from national organizations. Um, uh, doctors, um, Dr. Zarkin would have to speak to that, but I know when it's come up in the past, the ideal number that are recommended, there's, uh, I don't believe anyone who actually has that number, um, but I would need to defer to the experts on that question. Yeah, I'm fairly sure, Mr. Mahomza, that it's around 250 as opposed to our, our standards, and um, most systems are striving to get there. Um, 
and I think we compare favorably uh, statewide, but that was something we uh, will follow up with uh, a written response and at the next work session, Dr. Zarchin would be able to provide more. Um, my second question is, um, uh, do we pay for the BCPS1 um, system? The one that is currently ineffective right now? Yes, I think I think it's part of our our overall network, uh, but Mr. Corns might have a more precise answer. Uh, so, Mr. Mahomes, it, it was the question that uh, the BCBS one system that um, is not accessible currently. Uh, do we pay for it? Is that your question? Yes. Uh, no, no, sir, we do not. We um, that was created in house. And so uh, there is no annual revenue uh, being expended on it. And so um, it being down is not costing us uh, funding um, for paying for something that's not available. OK, and for the um, the websites, uh, I believe it's the online learning instructions that you go through BCPS1 to access um, like the. Shoot, I, I use these all the time. I'm sorry, I just forgot the names. Um, the, the digital so, resources. Yeah, the digital resources. Do we pay for those? Um, so that that would be um, uh, the, that. Yes, we do pay for many of those. Um, that funding coming through uh, curriculum and instruction. Um, the ones that were listed on that page, uh, with the exception of Office 365, which I believe was linked through there as well. Um, that does also come out of my budget. So um, since there, some of them have been ineffective or many students are, have been unable to access them, um, are, are we still going to be paying for this for the next in this budget? Yeah, I so, believe. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Mahomes, most all of those uh, systems have been um, linked through our curriculum in multiple ways and accessible through our Schoology environment. Uh, so the the use of those tools has uh, experienced an interruption, but we're um, rapidly bringing back most, if not all of them at this point. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Um, in, okay, and my next question is about transportation. Um, I've been researching uh, other jurisdictions. I know that jurisdictions that I know, but Baltimore City has a contract with the Maryland Transport Authority um, that provides um, the, uh, the, uh, the passes for um, students to ride uh, on the public bus. And these are like uh, students who live near the uh, city or other uh, busing routes. Um, have BCPS looked into this as an alternative um, to replace them? low uh, bus drivers and uh, and um, those students who don't have access to um, constant um, school buses well in the um the one difference is in the city it's much more feasible to mm -hmm. get from almost anywhere in the city to anywhere else in the city either through bus light rail etc and the city does not have a yellow bus system mm -hmm. uh, other than for special ed children and some elementary kids. So all middle and high schoolers have to take the MTA. That's the model uh, they built, but it's a lot easier to do within the city. As you, if you think about how the transit runs, it, it gets much more spread out once you leave the city. Mm -hmm. So there are places you can get to uh, within Baltimore County, obviously, but it's 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 much, much more limited. I know we do have some use of mass transit, um, especially for homeless children, mm -hmm. where that is an option that works. But I think it's just not as feasible and it's certainly not as time efficient um, as a school bus is in a traditional route. OK, um, so in, I guess my question would be, um, or like extracurricular activities where students uh, say they cannot partake in this instance because they, sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. I think if Mr. Patillo or Dr. Grimm are available, uh, they may, we do have 
uh, after school transportation for certain activities. Um, it's sometimes limited, uh, but it's it is a program that we offer. Uh, yeah, that was basically my question. If uh, I'll, I'll email it to you. Thank you. OK, thank you so much for that. Next we have Ms. Fawzi. Ms. Fawzi, are you there? Good evening and thank you. Um, first, I just want to dovetail with uh, my colleague board members. There's so many um, needs in our school system. Uh, there were before the pandemic, and now we know that there's even more after the pandemic. Um, I wanted to uh, understand about the um, financial impact of the ransom attack. Has there been a uh, an analysis of the costs and the payment by cyber insurance, and then what additional costs would be out of pocket. So Ms. Causey, we are still in the midst of uh, that work. And so um, when we are able to report that, the cost as you requested, we will be able to report that to the board. Thank you. Is there an estimate timeline as the board is working through these budget work s sessions? Just what you've heard before about the work. Um, all I know at this point is um, the the team is working through all of the next steps, and so I don't I can't say it coincide with the with the budget approval. But at this point, what we have shared before is just what we know at this time. So I would request that there would be at least an estimate that the board has not received information to know whether we're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of dollars. Um, at point of order, Ms. Causey, is this in regards to the operating budget or ransom? That seems like something you could email and then um, Dr. Williams could respond back to that. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Yes, it does uh, affect the operating budget. If the Cyber insurance doesn't cover all of the expenses, and okay. the board does That's not have information about that. Dr. Williams could email to you, um, but it doesn't seem pertinent to the operating budget that we're discussing right now. So it's potentially directly relates to the operating budget. Okay, so the timeline. So, Dr. Williams, if you could email Ms. Causey the timeline or, or when you we, you would let us know. I believe you've spoken on that before, um, but if you could follow up with her um, and um, let us know the timeline, that would be great. Madam yes. Chair, I'm curious, uh, why wouldn't this be addressed as all of the other operating budget questions are addressed? Well, it seems like there's not the answer for that right now, so he will get back to you with when he has the timeline for that. So if you have additional questions, um, please proceed. I do. I do have additional questions, <clears throat> but I would, Madam Chair, ask that, that those questions be uh, put in with the other operating budget questions in board docs and then the answers made available or the answer is that it's not yet available. Um, the other question I had was related to um, we understand that there were pivots needed to be made and um, to have Dr. Williams and staff provide the um, outline of what positions shifted from from where in the system to where else in the system so that the board can understand what happened to the operating budget for this year and then how that's going to potentially impact for next year. Um, was, was that a question? I'm sorry, Ms. Causey. I didn't, I wasn't completely clear on what you were asking or saying with that last statement. I'll be happy to restate. Dr. Williams uh, said earlier that in the pivots of the pandemic, 
Um, and given that the budget operating budget changed from what the board approved based on his recommendations because of the pandemic to an MOE maintenance of effort. Um, so there were shifts that were happening in personnel and he appreciated staff that were flexible. And so it would be helpful to the board to understand what those pivots were and <clears throat> are they likely to be to be maintained for next year's operating budget. So I'll jump in here. Uh, we reduced 10 non-instructional FTEs this year in FY21 as, as part of our cost saving measures and efficiencies. And I think in the highlights on each of the pages, we indicate what position was reduced. Um, and if the question is a comprehensive list that's something we can provide yes thank you that would be helpful sure at this point madam chair i'd like to make a motion for the board point to of order Ms. Fawzi, as you've stated before under your chairwomanship we don't do motions during work sessions um so um i'm not sure that a motion is appropriate at this time so madam chair um I believe it is appropriate at this time. You mentioned in your opening remarks that board members are to <clears throat> state their name before making motions. So uh, that's why I prepared to make a motion. Well, I before and what I'd like to do I, is uh, we don't present make motions my during, motion. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Madam We don't Madam make motions Chair. during our work session. Um, as you have stated multiple times, we don't, during a work session, we don't do motions. So I'm not sure. Um, what I stated in my opening session was that we would um, do votes by a roll call. So, um, but we, as a practice, and as you have stated on multiple times during your chairwomanship, that we don't make motions during a work session. So, um, at this time, it would not be appropriate to make a motion. So, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, it, you stated about that, and what I'd like to do is make the motion and see uh, what the board uh, feels the motion would be for uh, to direct the superintendent and the collective bargaining, the negotiating team to prioritize finding funding for 15 minutes a day. So considering we don't do motions during work sessions, then um, I would say that we would postpone that motion um, until February 23rd. So Madam Chair, we actually did make motions last year in the budget work sessions uh, specifically to um, uh, prevent the final meeting from taking a very long time. Also, the board is in the midst of, um, excuse me, the negotiating team is in the midst of bargaining with our um, master agreement <clears throat> with our bargaining units, excuse me. And TABCO has said that that is a priority for their uh, members and we've also received hundreds okay, of individual emails. Okay, so then let's emails. cut to the chase. We have a meeting on February 9th and we have a meeting also on February 23rd. So you've made your motion. Is there a second for the motion? Okay, hearing none, then we're moving on. Um, Ms. Hen, you're next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Have we benchmarked the proposed budget against other state LEAs and what were the results? Um, we we would not know what other LEAs are proposing for next year for FY22. None of that information would be available. Um, expenditures against um, against prior years expenditures for other LEAs. I, I can't point to a specific um, comparison. We do look at things, uh, different aspects of the budget at times uh, when the questions come up or when we want to uh, see how we compare, but I, I don't have a, um, I, I don't have a comprehensive comparison I could show you. We rely on MSDE for that information that they publish on their website. And can you speak to any information you gleaned from that information on the website? Well, it's usually a, a year or two old 
and so it it's not helpful in developing our budget um, there was a link to that page miss hen in the second set of questions we do include a link if you care to view that page at msd so i i have analyzed that data and, and i'm not a financial analyst by any stretch of the imagination but one observation i made was that um, BCPS's expenditures for administration um, or for all categories, I should say, with the exception of instructional salaries is, is at or above state average, whereas we fall short on instructional salaries as well as student transportation. So in looking at the proposed budget, I'm interested in knowing um, of any trends and what we are doing to um, ensure that our budget reflects our priorities, which is our schoolhouse. So my second question um, is, do you have available the budgeted per student expenditures by general fund category? And is that a breakdown you can provide either now or when can that be provided to the board? The most current information for the most currently uh, ended fiscal year is in the comprehensive annual financial report and that's just for bcps not other jurisdictions thank you to, to clarify i'm looking for the the budgeted expenditures and what that would look like um, on a per student breakdown so that we can um, benchmark that against other leas to see where we are trending and if there is a shift, as we say, towards our priorities of moving resources to our schools. So, Ms. Hen, this is uh, Dr. Scriven. Uh, we thank you for that question. That's a very complex question. If if you could email us that question, we will definitely research it and prepare a response for you on the full board. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. And to clarify, it's a follow up to question 25 on the first set of questions that I did submit. Okay. Uh, it was the chart showing the total cost per student by general fund category. Okay. I'm looking for the current proposal broken out by those general fund um, categories, what yes, the expenditures would be. Thank okay. you. Yes, ma'am. And my final question um, is on that same vein. It's what percent changes are proposed for each general fund category. So in other words, by category, what um, changes are proposed? In other words, which direction are we moving? Um, are we seeing a shift from administration to instructional salaries and wages, for instance, on a um, percent basis? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will, um, as the board requested, provide a full budget book, so you'll all, you'll be able to compare the activities across years. Great, and th this information generally yes. isn't provided in that. I do that analysis on my own, but that would be very helpful, Mr. Tantliff, so thank you. I appreciate everyone's hard work. Thank you for that. And next we have Mr. Kuhn, who had a follow-up question. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I'm going to uh, just quickly focus on the new energy management group and the spending associated with that. It used to be part of the facilities operations, and we're looking at page 34 and page 32. Um, so I have limited time. Could you please just explain what the $6.7 million in equipment is and what the other charges of $30 million are? Um, most of the expenditures in there are for energy, fuel, et cetera. And, and the group is not any different. Um, similar to your question earlier, we ju they just split into um, an energy only group as opposed to being part of a different part piece of facilities. And I, I believe that the, um, the equipment line, and if Mr. Dixit wishes to correct me, uh, is uh, the capital investment costs that were made in association with energy performance contracting and uh, the long-term agreements that we entered into for 
uh, refitting our uh, our lighting and our boiler and heating systems and, and other utility supplies. About $150 million investment that was uh, supported by the county government and and financed through this performance contracting program. Are you waiting for Mr. Dixit to answer if or is that the answer? If he is or I'll I'll verify that and follow up with you, Mr. Pugh. This is Diane Hegberg, um, fiscal officer that reports to Pete um, on behalf of Pete Dixit. Um, I am in agreement with your statement, Mr. Saris. That is the cost. That's the basis of that cost. Thanks, Ms. Hegberg. George, I'm back. This is Pete Dixit. If there's anything that you want me to say, I didn't hear the part of the question. I just came back. Uh, it's the page 34, the equipment line item, uh, which I think I and, and Ms. Hegberg felt was associated with performance contracting obligations. And, and that is absolutely correct. Okay. Thank you very much. So just so I'm clear and I'll I guess I'll be forced to submit a written question here. Um, but a performance contract was entered into to cover capital expenses over $150 million and the $6 million expenditure that we have year in, year out is to cover that? Yes, sir. It was done in three phases. Uh, these were 20 year obligations and uh, the uh, the system or the, the, the program was designed to generate a, a designated level of savings in utility costs that would uh, be adequate to pay the, the debt on the investment. And uh, we can provide a lot more data if you're interested in the program, but it was uh, it's funded basically by cost avoidance and uh, with the air, air conditioning um, improvements along with all the other infrastructure improvements has, has met its obligations to, uh, to generate cost avoidance adequate to fund the investment. Thank you, Mr. Saris and um, Mr. Kuhn, it looks like um, Ms. Calsey has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a process question. Um, the uh, work session was scheduled from 6.30 to 9.30, and uh, it seems that most of the board members have utilized their time. So would it be appropriate to entertain a motion for every board member to have another three minutes for this work session to ask questions or make comments? Again, we don't do motions during work sessions, so it would not be appropriate. Well, this is a process question. It's not related to the subject matter. Uh, of it's a process question during a work session, which we are in now where we are discussing the budget. So would that be appropriate to entertain a motion at this time? Madam Chair, I would request that um, board council weigh in on that. Mr. Bersese, um, is it appropriate as a rule at our previous work sessions, we've not done motions. So um, is it appropriate then to change that for this work session? I would say that the board should adhere to its prior practices and past practices. OK, and since our past practices are that, as Ms. Causey has stated in several previous work sessions, that we don't do motions during work sessions, then um, then we would not do a motion during this work session. Um, we've talked about it. We've asked questions. Members can submit additional questions, and we also have a meeting um, on February 9th as well. So 
um, if there are any additional questions or anyone has any questions as far as the budget, um, please let me know and we can um, address those now. So are there any additional questions from board members? Mrs. Scott, this is Rod McMillian. I have a comment. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Please go ahead. I think Mr. Mohamza had an excellent idea about the MT or MTA bus pass. I've been in a high school situation where there was an activity bus that ran three days a week after school, primarily for academic support, for kids that stayed after school for academic support and or club engagement. We tried to keep athletes off of that bus because it oftentimes would overcrowd the bus. Uh, some bus lines run right near schools, and that might be an excellent way for students to get home after the school activities closed down. So, and, and back to the activity bus, that came out of local schoolhouse funds. So when those funds dried up, that was over, and or if the principal, you know, didn't make the recommendation to do that, then that school wouldn't have that opportunity. So I think that's just something to, to, to discuss and converse. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, does staff have any follow up uh, information to add to what Mr. McMillian said? OK, if not, um, it looks like we have an additional question. Looks like Ms. Rowe and Ms. Pastor. Um, so Ms. Pastor, you can go ahead and then after that's Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Uh, I would like to piggyback on what um, Mr. McMillian and Mr. Mahumza um, said about the bus. Mr. McMillian uh, is correct. Uh, we often pay for that bus out of our funds, school funds, and I've received a number of requests from students, and I think that that is something uh, to, that we need to examine, especially now in light of our students hopefully going back soon at some point and all that they are going through this year that we take a different look at getting that um, after school bus so that students can continue in their uh, extra activities, especially those who've never participated until now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. And uh, also, Ms. Rowe, you had a question? Um, so I just wanted to speak to this idea. I think that if we wanted to add the option of public bus passes in addition to the other bus options we already have, that would be OK. But one of the things that I think people don't realize in Baltimore County, which is actually, in fact, a longstanding legacy of structural racism in Baltimore County as far as how transportation is allocated is that there are very many neighborhoods that do not have bus or public transportation of any kind to other schools and with the degree to which we use magnet programs in our middle and high schools we could end up with a situation where sure maybe there's a bus but in Baltimore County it can take you two hours to get somewhere by bus that it takes 15 minutes to get um, by car or whatever. So because of the inefficiency of public transportation in Baltimore County, I would not like to see a child even say they can't participate in a sport or they can't do something because they have a bus pass, but the bus is unreliable or takes them two hours to get from their house. Um, I mean, I know to get from Hillendale to Rosedale takes an hour and a half by bus and you have to change buses twice. So while in theory this sounds like a good idea, if the length of time it takes to use the bus is prohibitive, we could actually be creating an equity issue. Okay. Thank Ms. you for Scott, that. Oh, this, yes, sorry. This is Rod, is there this is yes. Rod McMillian. Can I respond to that? Yes, sir. Mr. McMillian, are you there? Yeah, I was on mute. Just a second. Wait a minute. I'm, I messed up technologically. <laughs> Mr. Are you there, Ms. McMillian? You, you can go ahead and respond. This, this, this is an option. 
It's not to replace a school bus, but it's an option rather than a kid walking up a highway. In my situation, it was 702. So if a kid didn't have a ride home, which oftentimes they didn't, and in the evening, so they had to walk up the road. This would be an option to look at you know, for some other way to get home rather than walk up a highway or up a busy street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. So, um, it looks like we have heard from everyone. And uh, and um, Ms. Pastor, you had a, a, a brief comment? Yes, brief. In equity last week, we talked about that way to get that door open. Mr. Uh, McMillian is right. It's an option, just an option. Schools can pay for their own buses or it can be a transfer. A lot of children do live on bus lines and to not make an option like that is excluding children. So it goes against equity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Madam and, um, Chair, could I just I, offer some information? Oh yes, sir, certainly. Mr. The Office of Transportation has a lot of options uh, mostly used for getting kids to and from school but we also do purchase a number of discounted bus tokens every year and those are provided and i i just my guess is that they they have other designated primary uses but it's definitely something that the office of transportation could uh provide some additional background on yeah, Mrs. Sarris, thank you for that. And that's what I was going to recommend, Madam Chair. We can look at what options we currently have in place uh, and present to the board. And then once uh, we all have a full understanding of what is currently uh, in existence, we can then take a deeper dive uh, if that's OK. I think that would be appropriate. Thank you for that. That's what yes, I was, was going to ask for. And I thank you all for your time and what you've offered um, to us this evening um, to help us understand the budget and to go over um, everything. Uh, it looks like Ms. Calls, you said you have a clarifying question. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to point out, I looked up in board docs January 5th, the work session on the fiscal year 2022 county capital budget in which uh, I did make a motion which was seconded by Ms. Hen and then approved uh, by the board. So it, it, it has been our practice to make motions during the work session. So I, um, I also believe it's appropriate to make motions according to the process. So the meeting was scheduled to go to 930 to discuss the budget and I would like to make a motion that each board member would have an additional two minutes for questions or comments to utilize the, the the time that has been allotted to us. If there's. Now, OK, so that was the first meeting and we as a practice do not make motions as you have said so yourself. We do not make motions at work sessions, so um, it's just curious that you are bringing it up. I mean, that was the first meeting. It was a business meeting, so at our work sessions, we do not. It's our practice not to make motions, so I choose not to bring that motion to the floor. Madam Chair, it is labeled in the um, Education Transparency Act as a work session, so we do. There have been some work sessions where we have specifically said we are not entertaining motions, but the statement yes. that were read in the opening said that we would say I our name before our making a motion. By a, I said we would um, vote by a roll call and so but we don't make motions during our work sessions so I choose not to bring it to the floor so I mean we've had a robust discussion over an hour long discussion on the budget and um, this is not a one and done we will have another meeting again on the budget uh, uh, on February 9th and we will meet again. Board members can email questions in, but we also have added to the agenda, which is what we need to go to now, is the reopening of our schools. And we have lots of parents, teachers, staff that would like to hear about that as well. So I think that we should move along and move to our next um, agenda item. So I would thank staff for their time and the presentations and everything that we have. And Dr. Williams, if you could continue now with um, the reopening, which was added to the agenda at the very beginning, I would like for us to now review that.
So, sure. So, um, <clears throat> we have our staff here, but um, since this was added, um, <clears throat> I'll start and then maybe some questions. Um, so, again, good evening, uh, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and board members. Um, <clears throat> as they, as you know, there's an interest tonight to hear an update about the reopening plan. Um, I'll start with last Thursday. There was an announcement by our Governor Larry Hogan and State Superintendent Dr. Salmon, in which they said uh, school districts or school systems would be mandated to open in a hybrid format by March 1st, 2021. Um, therefore, the plan that I shared last week outlined the steps uh, to prepare, and I referenced in an earlier meeting as ready, set, go. Um, and it is my understanding that Dr. Salmon made it clear uh, that the local school systems must comply uh, with her directive. Um, this past weekend, the Maryland State Department of Education provided an updated guidance in the form of a document entitled Maryland School Reopening Guidance uh, to help guide our planning process. Um, in that, it stated that some degree of in-person learning should be the immediate goal for all students in all jurisdictions. Um, however, there was no mention of health metrics during the Thursday's press conference and the state's document guidance document doesn't reflect any health metrics. We have been using the Maryland Health Department and MSDE COVID-19 guidance, which led us to develop our safety as our true north. Um, so I have begun conversations with our partners and our union leaders about this directive from Dr. Salmon um, and based on her announcement, the expectation is that local school systems are to implement um, hybrid in person by March 1st. Um, <clears throat> I will say that we have been focusing not on not only our plan, but also working collaboratively with the Baltimore County Department of Health to vaccinate BCPS staff. Uh, we began this process on Friday, January 22nd. Um, we had hundreds of staff members that received the vaccine. Uh, additionally, um, staff volunteering to assist with the volunteer clinics are being vaccinated. We will continue to vaccinate staff. Um, I believe we have this Friday and Saturday. Um, so when the availability of the vaccine, we have a group of staff to register and each time we're notified, we'll continue to add to that group based on the availability of the vaccines. Um, I shared with our staff um, the phase and approach that we presented to the board uh, where we identify staff and those uh, high contact staff, such as, as we mentioned earlier, in a presentation, um, bus drivers, our, our nurses clearly uh, fell into the 1A group, um, but pupil personnel workers and those providing related services, um, food services, build, building services, administrators. Uh, this past week, um, I, I meet with our union uh, presidents and executive director and TAPCO shared um, their survey data that they uh, sent out. And so I'll be looking at that data and comparing that with our data. Um, we as a system sent out a brief survey and we asked staff who would be interested in receiving the vaccine. And uh, out of about 18,000 employees, 11,000 responded. Um, <clears throat> with 80%, 80.8% saying yes, and about 19.2 um, responded no. Just to that simple survey, if given the opportunity, would you get the vaccine? Um, so again, we are uh, preparing 
as we have shared earlier about the different phases. Um, our plan, our original plan and reopening plan was approved by MSDE. Um, we held an information session for staff on January 21st, uh, where we had follow up um, with an FAQ to assist staff in the understanding of the role of the vaccine and how uh, to access opportunities to be vaccinated. Um, we may need to plan another information session about the vaccine and again include our partners from the Baltimore County Health Department and of course our wonderful staff um, from the Office of Health Services. And currently our BCPS safety managers have completed their first round of school vaccines. I'm sorry, school visits uh, to assess readiness and they are in the process of beginning the second round using the readiness checklist. So with that, I um, wanted to keep my comments brief and I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Scott. Thank you. Are there any board members who have questions about the reopening plan and the presentation that was just given to us from Dr. Williams? Okay, it looks like there's a question from uh, Ms. Mack. Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Williams, I had submitted some questions, but since we're having this meeting tonight, um, I'd like to know, does BCPS have adequate staff to fill any potential vacancies as a result of retirements, resignations, and leaves? So let me make sure I'm still on. Yes. So <clears throat> we continue to post and fill vacancies. Um, I'm assuming when you talk about retirements, resignations, and leave, you're talking about the schoolhouse. So the ideal time is to um, post in the spring and use the spring and summer to fill vacancies. And we also look at our December gra college graduates uh, to try to fill vacancies um, that we were unable to fill during the start of the school year. And so do we have adequate staff? Um, once we know about a retirement resignation or uh, well, let me just deal with those two areas. Um, then we go through our process to try to fill them as quickly as possible. Or when we hear about leaves, sometimes we it's a short term leave. So we'll provide a substitute um, and until the staff member is able to return. I should have been more clear. I, I, I'm speaking to potential people leaving the system not at the end of the school year, but in response to any type of edict that they return to the classroom before those individuals are ready to return to the classroom. Are we in a position if we lose a thousand teachers to quickly backfill them? So um, we we don't have a one to one ratio of of substitutes to teachers. We do have a pool of substitutes that we can pull from. And so I know HR has been fielding questions and responding to staff. Um, that is probably as much information I can provide tonight. And then my follow up question to that is anticipating that there may be a large number of people who want to take leaves or file paperwork. Is HR adequately staffed to handle that? And would do employees have access to the system that even shows them that shows them the amount of leave to which they are entitled. That's a very specific HR question. The second part about the leave. Um, I think if you were asked HR, they would welcome any additional staff to help with the process um, because they have been working not only to address questions from staff, but also the other parts of their work related to the ransomware cyber attack. Um, so at this point we can follow up about how they can access their leave, knowing that we are still working on our systems. 
um, as a as a school system, you know, the the human resources system or the self service system. Um, so what they may not be able to have access right now, they may be able to have access um, as we continue during this re repair and recovery phase. OK, I submitted these in writing, so I'll just wait for the answers. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Hager. Hi, um, I also submitted some questions um, today, so I don't know if you got a chance to see them, Dr. Williams, but my biggest question included a um, pretty little histogram that I made out of our uh, metrics that you guys have been posting on Fridays, and they clearly show that we're heading in a great direction. Um, and we know that the daily rates this week have been really positive and really good, and you know we're tracking them. And so I fully anticipate that by Friday, we're going to look like we're in really good shape. And so if that is the case, are we ready to hit the button on Ready, Set, Go on Monday so that we can start getting kids back in buildings three weeks later, which would be February 22nd? So I think the the, the one concern, um, Dr. Hager, is um, we were working with our unions for return and the announcement Thursday was more of here's the deadline March 1st and here's the research um, but there wasn't any reference around the metrics so that is going to be our continued work with our you with our staff I have to say with all staff um, I I have been so appreciative of Dr. Branch and his team and and our county executive as we're looking at vaccines and the availability for educators I, I would say the more we can get through that process the better it may um, lessen some of the anxiety um, but right now um, in the conversation I had with the with uh, the union on the union presidents and exec director on Monday there was a concern about um, the announcement and so as we described I believe it was last week we have a time frame so um with that time frame in terms of administrators returning then then our, our staff and developing schedules and bus routes um based on the announcement i think we can we can start small groups and bringing students back given that march 1st timeline it's just a week after february 22nd so yeah, I mean, I just it, it seemed like people asked me what I thought of it and I thought, well, it, it, we're on track anyway, you know, we're, we're heading in the right direction. And so it seems like with if we're going with a science based approach and using these metrics, then we are almost there. So that was. That was that well, point. Yeah, so, yeah, that's 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 the that's the con that's the question now um, the 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 health department, the Maryland Health Department and MSDE talked about research more about what wasn't happening at schools. Um, and so as as I shared on Friday, you know, we as superintendents, we wanted some clarity around that as well as what was happening in our own county. And, and so we're still having those conversations. Um, and again, to your point, we were preparing and looking at based on the direction of the board based on the fact that you know we we have to bring back some kids we we, we just have to bring back some kids so we were looking at all the different logistics around that now um based on the announcement it's kind of clear by by march 1st um i i do want to stress that we have a little bit of a challenge because of the ransomware things that we could turn ar around overnight really will take some time um as the principals got to look at you know the groups got to look at transportation all of that so um i i, I just appreciate your questions and i'll look at those questions dr hager and miss mack that you submitted um to see if we can get some responses to your questions. So the other thing is we had a, a bomb dropped on us at the beginning of this meeting about the sports motion that was made last time. Um, and I, I hear that the Baltimore County executive has uh, an executive order, 25 people. Our uh, January 7th approved reopening plan 
specifies that fall sports will include pods of no more than 20 people. So to me, they're apples and oranges. So I don't I don't see why it sounded as if the announcement at the beginning of this meeting suggested that our motion to start fall sports on February 13th had been negated by the county executive's order. But I don't think it had been because our own plan suggests we wouldn't have pods of more than 20 students anyway. So um, do you have a, a comment on that? And should we just continue to plan to see for February 13th? Because I know there are a lot of really excited kids around this around this county who are really looking forward to that date. So I would I would say give us some time to unpack that, Dr. Hager. That was really my request before just to look at the logistics. Um, the, the question now would be where our coaches would fall um, into any of the of the vaccines. You know, um, we were looking at when we look at our phase, we were looking at younger learners. Um, so it's the logistics trying to figure out how to go about doing that. And I'm not sure, uh, as I saw the county executive order, um, keeping it to a small group, it's just the logistics. And that um, return to play group committee has been very diligent about the logistics, the mitigation. Um, I, I would say we, we will need some time for that group to unpack everything that has been put on us about athletics to see. I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure if we can meet that only because of now this March 1st. I just, I just, the, the, there's, there's two different things happening at the same time and they're big things, yeah. big issues. Um, I don't know if we can meet that timeline, but again, I think that's a conversation that the return to play and, and Mr. Sai and Dr. McComas just have to unpack. And a yeah, lot I mean, of it's around the vaccinations I know around for for our coaches. I know it's a lot of moving parts, but um, it's laid out pretty nicely in our reopening plan. Page 61 it says pods of 20. So I think that we I don't see why we should not be able to meet that February 13th date. You know, it's we're approaching a year <laughs> that we've been out of school. So I know it's a lot of logistics, but I I, I feel like we can do it for the kids. It. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, Ms. Rowe? Yeah, so um, Dr. Williams, when we're supposed to go back on March 1st, that was one thing I wondered in relation to the sports um, thing. So when we return, is the school system oblig obligated to comply with the county executive executive orders as to maximum number of gatherings? And would that mean maximum number of people in a school, maximum number of people in classrooms? Um, or which jurisdiction do we listen to exactly? So we listen to a county executive. And in that executive order, it's, it was speaking to um, non-professional sports gatherings and events. Um, so that's different from um, what's happening inside a classroom. We follow the mitigation strategies um, and we work with our Office of Health Services along with Baltimore County Health Department. So okay. those are two different two different things. OK, so the, um, so now that we have the new guidance from the state, does that mean that the metrics are no longer a factor? Or are you still looking for clarification and further guidance on whether or not we're supposed to still consider metrics? The only thing I can say at this time, metrics were not shared in the announcement and in the document just like the document from the Maryland Health Department and MSDE that was shared back in August with metrics, this new document didn't reference metrics. Um, so it is my understanding that um, the, the state superintendent wants us to start bringing back students by March 1st. 
and 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 what I'm pushing for and working with the health department is to try to get as many of our staff uh, vaccinated. Um, so again, there was no reference about metrics. Okay, so as we start to send students and staff back to the schoolhouse, um, will we be able to be flexible with staff as far as allowing staff that haven't gotten the vaccine yet to be able to continue with the students who are virtual while teachers who have been vaccinated can be with the hybrid students in the classroom? So according to the press conference, um, the vaccine was not a prerequisite and we cannot mandate staff to get the vaccine. Um, so we will continue to work um, as I said, just this week just had an, uh, a conversation with our union president's um, executive director to unpack a little bit of what was shared on Thursday. We're still seeking clarity um, uh, from the from the Maryland Health Department and our state superintendent. So um, that announcement yeah, was. Go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. I guess what I'm looking for is not so much is it mandatory to get a vaccine. What I'm looking for is as a school system, since in a hybrid model, which will be for at least some period of time, will do we have the flexibility as a school system to adjust how we do things in such a way that teachers who want a vaccine or have health conditions where they need one can opt to stay teaching the virtual classes while teachers who've already been able to obtain a vaccine um, can be in the schoolhouse. And do we have the ability as a school system to offer that kind of flexibility while we're in the process of vac vaccinating people because there are not enough vaccines for everyone who needs it? So that wasn't described in the press conference or in the follow up conversation. It wasn't a, it wasn't attached to the vaccine, um, but we do have opportunities working through HR um, to work with staff if there is leave that needs to be taken. Um, and again, we I don't think we have that 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 flexibility to tie in the, the vaccines with whether folks come to work or not. That is my understanding because it's not required. We can't force you. We we have had, as I reported, we had a high percentage of folks that responded to our short survey, and there's great interest in receiving it. Great, um, a large percentage of 80% of those who responded. So, 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 are you saying that we don't have the ability to offer teachers the option to stay virtual if they don't feel comfortable coming back into the classroom? No, I just like that's what I'm hearing. I just responded to you tied it to the vaccine and I, and so I was just responding to that option. Staff members have options whether they want to take it or not is being encouraged and they don't also also um, they don't have to. Uh, they have other alternatives to try to get the vaccine and, and, and Dr. Branch reported that when he presented to the board to seek other op opportunities. But other than that, um, that is my understanding. We can't tie it to the vaccine. And in terms of scheduling classes and bringing back kids, we got to look at how do we meet the needs of our students and what what that principal may need in his or her building to bring back small groups of kids. That's as much as I can answer at this time. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Okay. Next we have Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Dr. Williams, um, I'd like to start by talking about the initial plan that has always been the goal and the focus of what you and your team have been working on, which was to bring schools back in some manner by February 1st. That was the goal. We know metrics are involved and we know we hit a spike and, and the spike is, is dropping rapidly as we speak. So. We should be prepared to move with your one, two, three snap or what have you. Um, and I, I would suggest that we start that activity immediately so that we are prepared 
because every week matters to these children. March 1 was the last date that the governor said. He said by March 1 at the, la at the latest, children should be in school or in some way, shape or form. So I guess I just want, I want to clarify that because what, I, what I'm kind of hearing from your conversation and your discussion of this matter is that, well, now March 1st is when we'll start. No, I no, sir. That that's a that's not that's not accurate. No, 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 sir. That wasn't that wasn't what I. That wasn't what I was trying to imply. It was by March 1st, we need to have. Um, some type of in person learning, and as I shared previously about the time frame um, in order to bring back our administrators, bring back our staff develop schedules, develop um, transportation routes, because we are still looking at cohorting students. So, so it wasn't that we were going to begin by March 1st. It was clear like last week's announcement uh, by March 1st that there needs to be some type of in-person learning going on. And with our phase in approach, you're right, we, we have identified uh, two groups, uh, our phase one and phase two. Um, we also uh, looked at our survey information um, for our principals to have additional information. So it wasn't that we were going to start on March 1st. We can't start on March 1st because last week's presentation says that there's certain things that we have to do to prepare and that will take uh, a couple of weeks. And so as Dr. Hager, and I'll have to go back and look at her question, um, and she said a little bit about a time frame. So it wasn't that we were starting on March 1st. March 1st was the time in which we have to have students back in, in some kind of um, in-person learning. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Sure. Um, one of my concerns and and the reason why I bring this up and I I continue to ask the same type of questions uh, based on your phased in approach it's not like every kid is going to walk into a school um, and we're going to be in a hybrid situation uh, to start uh, so can you please describe to everyone the timeline as to what it looks like from the initial part you know the initial of kids small groups walking in following your phased in approach to all the way through all kids having access to school how many weeks is that going to take so what we reported last week was a three to four week process for our phase in approach so some of that is overlapping um, as we bring back one group um, a week or so we can look at another group i, I don't have um, by march 1st we will not have 111,000 students or back in buildings that but your question is a follow-up question about what will that timeline look like from our original plan of phase one all the way to phase four. Correct. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes, I, wanted, I, want, I want everyone to hear you say how long it's going to take to start this and then get everybody in school. So right now I will just say we're looking at our phase and our hope is to uh, look at the first two groups as we continue to bring back uh, students that fall into phase three and phase four. In terms of a time frame, we, we have a clear directive about uh, some in person. We will continue to add students we will continue to encourage our staff to get the vaccine. But for me to, to approach and tell a time frame, as we enter in a new quarter, uh, I it is my hope that we can get as many kids as possible 
as we are transitioning from all uh, remote to now this hybrid approach. And, and then I must say that, you know, parents still have the options of saying, I want my kid to remain um, at, on the virtual learning. So um, we are using our data to map that out. So um, again, that's all I can say at this point. And again, if, if I have additional information, we will look and see if, if I can give some more clarity around a time frame as we look at our results and we look at our scheduling of students to say a specific date to have all students who choose hybrid. Um, this is the time that all students will be back into a building but as of tonight i don't have that right I, I i understand i'm out of time i but i've asked this question multiple times and you've actually presented it and i believe that it's a four to six week time frame to go through the phases that's really all i'm looking for and for you to basically reinforce to the public tonight thank you thank you for that mr coon and dr williams um miss pastor Yes, Dr. Williams, I apologize in advance if I'm being redundant, but it's just been so much about um, going back and the T and the staff. So in the schools that go back, um, I understand in the survey there was a third option and there was some, I've, I've spoken to quite a few people who were unclear about what it meant, some sort of relationship with HR. If we're still in hybrid, even if you're a teacher of the group going back, if you, for some extenuating circumstance that doesn't keep you from teaching, but not being able to go right back in, or you're the caretaker, um, is that one of the options, a consideration that you may remain virtual um, until such time as health-wise or care-wise you're able to return is that one of the options and again i apologize if you've already addressed that so um is maria lowry on the call i am can you yes. share <laughs> from the hr perspective i don't want to misspeak sure. on that sure so um miss pastor essentially what we are doing is um we are working with our employees on a case by case basis. Um, we are also working with um, Tabco um, to have some conversations about um, what some of the ideas that they have um, to get some input from them. And then we are also working with Dr. McComas and the um, the team to take a look at the way that the, the schedule run and the way that the cohorts are scheduled um so that if, if there are some possibilities with some of our staff that have some extenuating circumstances that we can work to address that um the you you may or may not know that um the ffcra leave was extended through march 31st um so we had the option to um continue that um, through that date, which would help some of our staff that have um, some extenuating circumstances, especially with childcare. We do not know if that will be extended beyond March 31st, but if it is, we will examine that at that time to see if we would be able to, to um, extend it through um, whatever period they may look at. They may look at extending it through the end of the year, but that's a that's something that comes to us from the federal government. But um, we are trying to align um, the requests that the employees bring in with um, the guidelines related to FMLA, um, ADA, et cetera. Um, we do realize that we have some staff that quite honestly, they're just scared and we understand that. And so we are doing our best to work with um, our healthcare providers with Cigna to provide resources to those staff members, um, as well as even help staff that are having difficulty finding childcare, we have some resources through Cigna to help with that as well. Um, so it's not a, um, a quick and easy answer um, because it's a, each circumstance is slightly different. And um, we're trying to work with those employees individually 
to address their individual needs and concerns. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Thanks Absolutely. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Some of my questions were answered, so I'll just be real quick. Um, the county executive order that voided the motion that was made earlier, uh, that was a motion that I abstained from from a last uh, meeting because I didn't have enough information to make an educated decision. Uh, but I heard Dr. Hager say that her motion was for pods of 20. And being a parent with kids that play sports, just each team has at least 12 members. That by itself is about 25 students plus coaches. So I don't know how that numbers would work. And secondly, the survey results, Dr. Williams, that I believe today was the last date. Uh, is it possible for the board to get a breakdown of how parents have responded? Because clearly, you know, a lot of parents want school to start and I have two kids, so I fully agree. Uh, schools need to start, but there is also some parents that don't want schools to start. And I, wonder, I was wondering if we could see a breakdown of where they fall, because the kids that you know people say are failing, we were failing these kids, kids before the pandemic, and um, it's not something new. We knew we were failing those kids, and what we have to do is make sure we don't continue to fail them. So that's something I'm more interested in than just randomly opening schools. Um, thank you. Sure, Ms. Joes, we will um, look at that data and provide that uh, to the full board uh, once we have that ready, so not a problem. Thank you for that. Um, next, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Williams. How will hybrid instruction meet state requirements for hours of synchronous instruction, and will that include concurrent teaching and for what grades? So, Dr. McComas, you want to um, yes. respond to that, please? Yes, sorry, I just wanted to make sure I didn't cut you off. Um, so, good evening, uh, Ms. Hen and, and members of the board and Dr. Williams. Uh, Ms. Hen, yes, uh, the um, we would our, our students in virtual learning, even as we move into hybrid model, would meet the requirements set forward by MSDE. Um, and your second part of the question was concurrent instruction. Um, as we've explained in previous presentations, once we move into phases three and four, we would move to a concurrent instructional model at that time. And that is part of the method of ensuring that those students who are having a virtual learning day or if they're in cohort C and choose to have a virtual learning uh, model altogether uh, would still meet those requirements. They'd still have um, qualified teachers teaching the standards uh, within those guidelines. So thank you. Thank you. Um, my question um, is for Dr. Williams. What direction do you need from the board to commit to a definitive path forward that returns all students who opt to return in person as soon as possible? That's a good question, Ms. Sin. I think we need more vaccines. I think um, one is educating our staff, um, looking at that time frame in which um, staff can get their uh, scheduled appointment and then the second dose. Um, I, I would say at this point, um, just working with our local officials to try to encourage that um, we need more uh, vaccines, we need more opportunities for our educators. Um, some of that is a little bit of the fear about um, the vaccines, the availability. So at this point, just that advocacy in any uh, any people, anybody that you know, anybody you, you have access to, just encouraging that uh, we want to we want to encourage our staff um, to get the vaccine as we're looking at reopening. Sure, and part of the fear and frustration that I'm hearing anyway, and I'm sure you're hearing as well, is fear of the unknown and individuals have expressed um, the, the desire to for more information and and I have gotten feedback that the communication is greatly improved. So thank you to you and to staff for those improvements. However, um, they are looking for a commitment to a path forward and for information and um, 
commitment from the board and looking specifically to the board. So I'm I'm seeking ad advice and input from you in terms of um, what you need from us in terms of um, providing that direction to you in terms of solidifying our commitment for that path forward. And the vaccines are not within the board's control. Um, the things you mentioned, while we certainly can be advocates for, are not within the board's control. What are within our board's control is the decision to open, the decision to put a timeline around opening, and we've heard from the state that vaccines are not a dependency on opening and that there is, um, and this is subjective, but no public health concern um, that would prevent us from reopening. So can you speak to that? And if there's anything we can do to help solidify for our stakeholders, particularly our staff, a plan forward with some more concrete um, milestones. So as I shared last time that we, we have a plan, we have our phase in model. Um, I, I think at this point, the unknown as you describe, I, I think there's just anxiety about the return and whether we're using the metrics or whether we're not using the metrics. Um, the director from the state superintendent, um, I, I think you do have you, you do have positions, you do have connections uh, to help with uh, working with the powers of be, our elected officials, working with our health. Those conversations are important. We will we will manage the logistics, we will manage the operations. Um, but you know, in talking to staff and having information sessions, we, we're just trying to educate as much as possible, not only about the vaccines, but also our plan and how we've laid out our phase approach. Um, so that's that's as much as I can share at this point. Uh, as I get clarity, uh, still working with our state superintendent, there may be additional information I can provide um, to the board, but at this point, um, I just think we're looking at two things, working with our staff to, to help them to understand about the vaccine and working with our staff to, to start bringing back students. Um, we, we are all interested in bringing back students. And so um, let me think about that question a little bit more, Ms. Hen. Maybe there's some additional information I could provide, but um, that's just how I see it at this point. Just trying to assure staff and our families that we have a plan, we're working with our partners with the vaccines, um, and we're looking at our mitigation strategies and, and making sure every school is prepared to receive students and staff. So thank you for that question. And I appreciate that, Dr. Williams. And to Mr. Kuhn's question, I think having some parameters around um, the plan, specifically an end date by which all students who opt to return we expect to be able to return, at least if it's a date, would be helpful. And if we could have that date by February 9th, our next meeting as a goal, I will not be making a motion to that end, but I'll be making that request of you. And if the board um, is of like mind and consensus to make this request, I think it's uh, Ms. the time. Yeah. Okay, so next we have Miss Lisa Mack. Miss Scott, I could we respond to that? Could Dr. Williams respond to my last comment? Uh, no, I believe he responded already. Um, I, okay, I made a last sure, comment. Excuse me, point of order. We need to make sure that there's enough time for everyone to speak. Um, I so, I, I, I was within, next. Madam Chair, I was within my time with my last comment. If Dr. Williams could respond. You were still please. speaking um, for your last comment. Dr. Williams can respond to you in an email. Go ahead, Ms. Mack. Well, to that point, I'll go ahead and ask Ms. Hen's question. Dr. William, would Dr. Williams, would you please respond to Ms. Hen's question? And then I'll ask my questions because I have okay. time left. Ms. Mack, if you could repeat Ms. Hen's question then, and that is going Ms. to be added to your time. Okay, Ms. Hen is asking Dr. Williams to be able to come to the next board meeting with an end date by which all students will be back in school. She was looking for a commitment from Dr. Williams that he would provide that by the next meeting. I'm happy to provide an end date. I, I have been uh, asked to provide updates at our upcoming meetings 
and so I'll be happy to provide some kind of end date. Um, not sure if the next meeting I can do that, but that's something I will strive to to do. OK, thank you. And then my question is a piggyback to Ms. Rowe and Ms. Pasteur's. Um, Ms. Lara, you mentioned bringing back some of our staff on a case by case basis, but if the TAPCO survey shows that 50% of student teachers want to come back and 50% want to teach virtually, mm -hmm. Can we be creative and accommodate something like that? It, it helps us keep our teachers. It helps kids who are doing well virtually to continue to do well. Can we look at it on a more global um, basis? I know the state has said bring have kids back, but I don't think it said all your teachers need to come back. So do we have the ability to look at that? Ms. Mack, we, we are taking with our teachers. Um, I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is we have to be able to fulfill the schedule that is created based on the number of students that go back because I don't think a parent would want to send their children back to a classroom that has a substitute in it while a teacher is teaching that group of students virtually. So there are a variety of things that have to be considered in order to be able to make these other options work. And first and foremost has to be our ability to deliver the instruction face to face with and with providing the teacher in the classroom to do that versus again filling it with a substitute or filling it with somebody to cover the class while somebody is teaching then remotely. So that's why I say we we really do have to look at some of these things on a case by case based upon the information that the teacher is presenting, as well as look at some other options that once we really have solidified who exactly is returning in the way of students, that will give us a little bit more insight into what some of these other um, options are. One example I could share with you would be if you're at a school where there is only one art teacher and there are students that need to have art and that art teacher wants to teach virtually, um, that, that is a, a little bit more difficult scenario to try to come up with an option for. So we are trying not to give a broad brush no we will not do this at all. We're trying to work on what are some um, possible options that we could look at, um, but would still provide that level of instruction face to face that we're looking for once we have the students come back. So I, I know it may not be the, um, the definitive answer you're looking for, but um, what I will say is that we, we are not going to, this is something that we will have to continue to look at, revisit, work on, and and um, readdress as we go through this second semester, because as we go through the phases, it will also impact us differently, and we will have to go back to it. And we we are committed to revisiting that. We are committed to continue to try to um, do some additional things that will replenish our substitute pool as we continue to exhaust that as we go through. But there, nothing can replace that teacher in the classroom working with the children directly. Ms. Larry, I appreciate your response very, very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Malumza. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Williams, um, one of the saddest things about um, the reopening of schools is how politicized it has become. Um, throughout the process and especially these past couple of months. Um, and I know that with the governor's decision, um, it, 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 it just increased that politicization. So, and I know that he's um, um, at odds with certain um, health uh, officers in certain counties. I'm just uh, curious to know, uh, what is uh, Dr. Branch uh, saying in your conversations with him? Is he, um, uh, 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 agreeing with the governor's um, arguments of reopening schools that it's safe to do so without uh, vaccines like I know that Ms. Uh, Hand mentioned and some of the other things he said in his press conference. What are you hearing from Dr. Branch in your conversations with him? 
So what Dr. Branch and I are talking about are strictly around the vaccines. Um, and I can't speak on his behalf uh, about um, what his reaction was to that announcement last week, but our conversation uh, as we're looking at re reopening and, and you know, I, I do feel at this point we, we have to bring back kids. We have to bring back kids, small groups of kids. Uh, Dr. Branch has been talking to us about just the process of trying to get more staff vaccinated. As you heard what I reported that we have volunteers showing up uh, to help and kind of learn this process. Dr. Branch wants us, that's our Office of Health Services, our, our nurse, um, nurse assistants, our health techs to start learning the process so we can work uh, collaboratively with, with, with the Department of Health uh, to get as many staff. He has been really focusing on um, just getting the community through uh, the, the process up there at Timonium. And so having watched that well, well run, well organized. Um, so that's been his focus. We have been talking about the metrics. We've been talking about our plan. Um, but I won't speak on his behalf. I know his focus is trying to get us as educators um, through that process. And I know that that has been his priority as well as well as work with uh, some of our um, elderly, our healthcare professionals, et cetera. So um, yeah, that was the last conversation I had with them. Yeah, and I, I know you mentioned vaccines and I, I'm, not, I'm not asking for an opinion. I'm just saying would, would, would you say in your conversations you would agree that we can open schools without the vaccines? I believe that we don't need the vac everybody vaccinated. Would, would he agree with that? From your I agree? I'm sorry, do I agree no, with did that? He, did he, did he uh, verify that we would not need everyone vaccinated um, to open schools? Well, he, he knows that we can't require this from everyone. So there would be that by opening school, there would be that opportunity that some um, may have gotten the vaccine and some have not. Um, but that, that could be a follow up conversation I can have with with Dr. Branch. OK, and um, with uh, recent news about uh, the new variant of the COVID um, coming from uh, England and South Africa and Brazil, um, I know and I know that uh, the producers of the vaccines, Moderna and uh, Pfizer and Bio BioNTech have said, um, and I believe one have said one of them said one, their vaccine is 75 percent effective uh, for the new variant. Um, if the new variant does um, spread and the vaccine is, it, it turns out is not that effective. What is the plan if we have to go back into lockdown? And I hope it doesn't. But for us to have a smooth uh, return back to lockdown, if the pandemic worsens, because that is a possibility, what is the plan? Have you guys produced one? So that's the big discussion about this new strand and the plan would would be we would have to pivot again. And if that is the case, if 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 our health professionals are saying something slightly different, they will they will advise us about what we would do. Um, similar to what happened uh, early this year with certain school systems that had small groups and and they had to make a change and uh, we would do likewise. Um, but I don't have a response regarding the new strand at this at this time. Um, okay, and I, and I guess my last question is really, uh, I really want an update from my previous uh, question uh, the last time we had these discussions. And it was on uh, graduations and end, end of the year. Uh, 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 update on this will be really important. Uh, where are the discussions uh, that you're having? on that. Sure, the last time that we presented, um, we were going to provide an update. We picked we picked a time in February where we wanted to check in with our universities. Um, and so as we continue to provide updates regarding reopening, at some point I can share just the status of our graduations. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Causey.
Ms. Causey? Yes. Mm. Yep. Dr. You're up. Dr. Williams, I heard you say that um, you agree with uh, the state superintendent has the authority to give us a March 1 deadline. What I shared was that is my understanding she has that authority to give us a March 1 deadline. OK, and I'm reading from the Maryland School Reopening Guidance that's available <clears throat> online. I sent it to all the board members earlier today. And the updated guidance states some degree of in-person learning should be the immediate goal for all students in all jurisdictions. Is that your understanding from the guidance? You're reading from the guidance? Yes. OK. In the reopening. Oh, I'm sorry, you're still continuing. OK, go ahead. Yes. In the reopening plan that's posted on the website, it has phase one still listed as the public separate day schools, phase two as a preschool through grade two. And um, is that still your plan when you're speaking to phase one and phase two? Yes, uh, I believe we got to focus on our younger learners and that's the group uh, staff that we are opening up this opportunities for uh, the vaccine. So we're doing that at the same time. We're looking at the first phase one and phase two, looking at phase three, finalizing those survey results, um, looking at CTE. So um, yes, I, I, I believe the phase in approach um, to, to get as many students as possible. Um, but starting with the younger students and as the board shared two meetings ago about the phase one, the, remember the phase one groups were, were prepared to uh, bring start back in November and then there was a, a continued spike in the metrics um, and the State Department uh, bed and in, in the health department did not uh, waver on those metrics at that time. Now that as they were reported last Thursday, there's research. They watched this. Um, they looking at other school districts and, and they gave us that time frame of March 1st. So it is our hope and the request that came earlier to look at what will be that timeline uh, that I can report back. Um, looking at the other phases to get students back was the request earlier. To clarify, Appendix L and Appendix M would start at the same time March 1st. And you're looking at our reopening plan? Yes. OK. I want a clarification because there was information you sent out that did not clearly indicate that. Not looking at the appendix, I would say it is our hope to bring back to begin with phase one and phase two. And then phase in the other groups. OK, so. This week after the announcement, Howard County and Harford County both have had two work sessions to address the reopening plan. Howard County has presented a plan to their board. Phase one starts with students receiving in-person instruction for five days a week. Phase two would begin two weeks later. Those are their uh, special populations. Phase two would be two weeks later on March 15th, include all students pre-K through two, grades six, nine, and 12 and CTE and third phase would begin two weeks on March 29th. Is that what you're looking at for our reentry plan? Based on the question from Ms. Hen and probably what Mr. Kuhn asked, that's, that was the request that was asked of me to look at that timeline. Thank you. 
Thank you. And are you familiar with the? Dr. Chan has stated. She is the acting deputy secretary for public health for the state of Maryland. School reopening decisions should not be based on the availability of vaccination or the level of vaccination among staff. <laughs> yes, that was her comment last Thursday, and those were some questions that surfaced when I met with our union presidents and executive director. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Palsy, and thank you, Dr. Williams. Yes, thank um, you. And with that, I would make a motion that Dr. Williams bring a uh, complete plan to the board at a meeting that is scheduled for this week or no later than next Tuesday. I'm sorry, could you repeat your motion? Yes, I make a motion that Dr. Williams bring the complete plan to the board for approval at a special meeting this week or no later than next Tuesday. All right, is there a second for this motion? Okay, so hearing none, then we're moving on. Um, I would like to say in regards to the opening, um, or rather the presentation that was given to us, Dr. Williams, this is um, Ms. Scott. And I would like to say that um, I have heard um, information and, and updates about the um, reopening plan, and I appreciate the hard work and everything that you all put into that to give us that information. I just want to, I think it hasn't been said enough that we want to make sure that once we open, we stay open, and also that we have um, the concerns of staff and students and um, everyone um, as first and foremost um, in our decision making and using that as we navigate and um, move forward. So um, I just wanted to to say that I know that there are it's there's heated debates and there's people who want to go back and um, I've, I've heard from the community from both sides, people who want kids back in school and folks who are as I believe um, was said by Ms. Lowry, uh, terrified to go back. So it's our role as the board to look at, at everyone and to work in, in a holistic fashion. So I wanted to make sure that I said that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Pastor, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I want to piggyback on what you just said, if I understand it correctly, or maybe I didn't understand the motion. Is the motion to have a completed plan during this week and by next Tuesday at the latest. Well, the motion the failed, Ms. Pastor. Okay, but I, I, I was that the motion. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Pastor. Yeah. That was and it did. Um, I, I just want to reiterate that for all the questions that we have asked, that we want you to be, as Ms. Scott said, as thorough and exact as you possibly can, so that we don't go back and come go in and then come back. And I do appreciate the things that the staff is doing to get our children back in. And I want you to continue to be thoughtful in that deliberation. Thank you, I just wanted to, I knew it had failed, but I wanted to piggyback on you, Ms. Scott, thank you. And oh, hello, yeah, there was a lot of feedback there. Um, it looks like we have a question from Ms. Jose. No, Ms. Scott, that was for the motion, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, it looks like we have a question from Dr. Hager. Yes, um, so my, my time is up for asking questions, but I, and I would have much rather spent my time asking questions about reopening schools, um, but we got a little bit derailed with the sports conversation, and so my question as someone who's made very few motions and, and still, still learning um, the school board, function, it, a motion was made a week ago to start sport, fall sports on February 13th. That was when we had three and a half weeks to plan. Um, we're now a week later, so now we have two and a half weeks to plan. And again, the there was some pushback suggesting that there was a county executive order that made it so that we couldn't do it, but it doesn't seem to me, at least based on our own opening plan, that, that, it's, that it even con, con, contradicts one another. So, 
Is it is there any precedent for making a motion to make sure we do the motion or is there kind of what, what's okay. the next step to make sure um, that that it happens? I guess is my question. Certainly. Thank you for that, Dr. Hager. Um, and I, you said that there was uh, some pushback that there was a supposed county executive plan, but there is there there is a, a county executive order. So no, I'm, if, I'm, yeah. that's what I meant to say I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So um. If um, staff are on either um, Mr. Bersades or Ms. Howie, if you could give us some direction on that, um, because as as it was stated, the executive order states that uh, the motion is contrary to the county executive's order. So um, if we could get some well, guidance. So, but, I, but that's what I don't. It's not contrary. There is an executive order and there is a motion and the motion would align with our plan and our plan is not contrary to the executive order. But the motion. So I worry. I worry that we lost a week on. Um, okay. So it, um, if we could get legal um, input on that, please, so that we can make sure that we are in compliance. Sure, Eric Brusetti's here. I, I would suggest that uh, the the superintendent and his staff review the board's motion, compare it with the county executive's order, and see if they are compatible. I, I haven't read it with uh, any great detail. I've just uh, pulled up a copy uh, during today's meeting. I understand that in the county executive order, there's some parameters for indoor sports, some parameters for outdoor sports, and who gets counted towards the number of people uh, allowed for each. So uh, that seems to me more to be uh, an administrative uh, determination to be made in conjunction with uh, the board's prior motion. Trying to square those two. OK, yeah, because we're now down to two and a half weeks. So yeah, um, yeah. So it's yeah and I know the county executive's order um, is effective until February 28th and the motion had to resume was to resume fall high um, sports on February 13th. So right. yes, and, and according and, to the according to the state plan, competitive play would not start until March 5th. So it would only be practices, which okay. it, according to our plan would be done in pods of 20 or less. So again, they're they're not contradictory to each other. So, so I we, would really hope we can pull this off in two and a half weeks. Okay, we can get up. Um, Dr. Williams, I believe said earlier, and Dr. Williams, I'm sure you're still there. If you if you could um, uh get us some additional information on that so that we can make sure um, that we are um, working in the right direction. Thank you. Yes. Scott, this is Rod McMillian. Can I have ask a question or a comment? Yes, Mr. McMillian. Dr. Williams, is there anybody on the staff that's available that can answer the question about the 20 people in a pod? Is that practice, was that tryout indoor versus outdoor? That might save us some time if we can define that 20 pod thing. Thank you. Hmm. Is there anyone on the call that would be able to answer that or is that something that um, Dr. Williams will have to respond back to? I'm looking. Um, Dr. McComas, are you able to respond to that? Yes, sir. I, I didn't want to, again, uh, cut yep. you off inadvertently. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so as written in the um, plan, it does describe that we, um, any in-person activities, we would, of course, manage group size. And we do indicate uh, the, the pod size in there in the plan as uh, referenced. Um, and and I think Ms. Causey may have said this earlier, but our um, general plan is in the reopening plan in the link uh, on our website. It's one of the appendices. Um, I think to me the question um, came down to, um, I think the, and Dr. Williams, I heard you um, reference, cite a quote from the executive order. I think that's the part that we need clarification on. And I don't, let me see if it's in the chat. I think the um, where it says shall also include all non-professional sports gathering. I think that's the language that um, we need uh, clarification on is my understanding. Yes, I would thank agree. You. Thank you. So yes, uh, Dr. Williams, if you could. Yes, um, yes thank you, Dr. McComas. Chair Scott. Yes, thank this you. is Mr. Keen. I, I just wanted to make a comment uh, that might help clarify some of this. 
Yes, Mr. Kuhn. On the Baltimore County website, there is a document um, that is associated with uh, the executive order that is called interpretive guidance. I put the link in our chat and I've also cut and pasted the specific part that is um, related to high school sports. And it does say that the 25 person limit is inclusive of coaches, trainers and staff, as well as parents, guardians and spectators. Um, so it seems to be that if there's a 25 person limit, and our plan was to have 20 person pods practicing together that uh, Dr. Hager is correct and that this motion is applicable and needs to be executed um, as we have passed it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Kuhn. Um, Dr. Williams, when would you be able to uh, confirm that information for us? And so that it could be, if it is applicable, which we voted for it um, that it could actually go into motion or if there's um, a reason why it, it would not be able to um, be executed. Sure, so um, Dr. McComas and Michael Sy and I just need to have a conversation. Um, they heard the motion at the last meeting. This executive order was raised as a concern. We just have to just make sure we are following and understand what's there and how we're trying to move forward to try to meet the timeline in which the board uh, approved to bring back uh, fall sports. Okay, so, thank you. So yes, if we could, if there, is it possible that we could know something um, uh, by tomorrow or, or um, as soon as possible is I guess what I'm trying to say. <laughs> sure, sure, as soon as possible. OK, that would be great. And um, and then we will um, circle back um, with board members and and um, and um, go from there. So um, thank you, um, everyone who weighed into that so that we can make sure um, that we have um, appropriate um, actions going forward. And um, I'm wanting to make sure I got everyone's question. Ms. Causey, are you asking an additional question or did or is that from before? Madam Chair, thank you. I have a question regarding this conversation. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So the the board has a directive and you've asked Dr. Williams to um, clarify for us um, <clears throat> this uh, issue with the county executive's order. So is it your understanding, Madam Chair, that he will reply to the board in writing? You had mentioned tomorrow um, I think that that's a sufficient deadline um, given all of the logistics that need to start for the board's directive to to uh, be fulfilled. Correct. Yes, my understanding is that the um, and I uh, apologize if I if I wasn't clear. Um, my understanding is that Dr. Williams will reply in writing to the full board um, with the information by tomorrow. Yes, I, he he said it as soon as possible. So I think tomorrow is a a good concrete. Deadline. Well, folks, I would say I understand how important this is. I, I was giving us a few more days, um, <laughs> just because, as Dr. Hager saying said, we're getting close to that February deadline. So uh, I did say as soon as possible. I, I just want to make sure, as Mr. Bersadi's reference. I just want to get with the legal team just to make sure um, that is straight and then also need to have a conversation with our, our coordinator of athletics um, as they are preparing to receive students and coaches and what that will look like. Um, they have started that conversation. So as, as much as I would like to, I, I, that's why I reference as soon as possible. And, and okay. As soon as possible, would that be like sometime this week, perhaps? I can strive for something this week, okay. but tomorrow I would I would ask that later this week. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, I also want to ensure that any additional um, concerns or barriers to implementing this directive be brought to the board's attention immediately, given the time sensitivity of this issue. I would have wished that this concern had been brought to us sooner. 
um, in that it was our, I believe our assumption that um, we were moving forward. Um, so I would also ask Dr. Williams to bring any additional concerns to to us in a timely fashion as well. Sure, well, Ms. Sam. That's why it was brought up yep. at um, the beginning of this meeting so that board members um, could know and, and be aware. So um, this week I think would be good so that we can um, move forward and um, be able to um, work on implementing this. Um, was there any other discussion around this or any other questions that members had? Um, Ms. Scott, I, I would just add that, you know, that again, this week is great, but then we'll be down to two weeks. And so at that point, it would be great if we could sooner rather than later get physical forms, you know, going and kind of start start the process of things that that need to happen regardless of whether we start February 13th or February 20th or, Fe you know, February 20th. It, it, whatever we can do to kind of get the ball rolling with families um, while we're planning and talking to legal teams and doing the behind the scenes work, I think could be really important. It's just just as a, a side note. No, and it is it is very important. Um, and so thank you for raising that. Um, but we want to make sure that we do our due diligence and that we encompass everything going forward. So um, thank you for that member. So um, was there any were there any other additional questions or comments? Madam Chair, I wanted to make a motion that the superintendent and staff will bring to the board February 9th a complete plan for implementing the reopening plan with phase one and two starting March 1, phase three starting March 15th, and phase four starting on March 29th. Second. To the February 9th meeting. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Hen. Ms. Hen, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, discussion, it looks like there's a question from Ms. Jose. Madam Chair, may I speak to my motion? Yes, Ms. Palsy. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, one of the things that's been discussed a lot and we've received a lot of emails is about the timing. Uh, we have um, teachers that need to plan. We have families that need to plan. We have students that need to emotionally prepare. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth, and I would suggest that uh, there are two other districts, Hartford County and Howard County, who this week are, be are being presented by, from their superintendent the plan uh, <clears throat> for their approval, uh, and then they're going to be able to start the work and get all of those communications out. Um, also, there's three other of our uh, nearby districts, Anne Arundel County, Carroll County, um, and Baltimore City that already are implementing plans um, to bring students back prior to March 1. And then now, of course, they're working towards uh, the full <clears throat> implementation of the state superintendent's um, um, directive. Um, and with Dr. Uh, Chan, Maryland's acting deputy secretary's guidance, uh, that it's not based on the vaccination level. Um, so it's important that the that the whole school system, uh, our parents understand the board's uh, direction, the board's approval of the superintendent's recommendations, and that there is a start date. We all know people plan to a deadline. And so I want I just want that to be clear. And then also that that um, on that February 9th, um, you know, there would be motions if necessary uh, based on that plan. Thank you. Uh, next is Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, so my understanding, Dr. Williams, you were going to bring a, a plan back, a, re a revamped plan, if you may, back to the board for uh, possibly starting does, uh, in March 1st. Does Ms. Causey's motion actually ask the superintendent to start schools March 1st and giving us a four week window to prepare? Or is it just a generic, give us a, a plan back on again? Because I would also like to have an, uh, a window, but is that what your motion is directing that schools start back March 1st? Ms. Jose, is that question to me or Dr. Williams? To you, since it's your motion, is your motion directing Dr. Williams to bring a plan back on February 9th to start schools February 1st? I mean, sorry, March 1st. Apologies. 
the motion is yes to support the state uh, to <clears throat> in order for the board uh, and the school system to to be compliant with the state superintendent's directive and also for the benefit of our students uh, to have that amazing in-person instruction from our teachers and for there to be a plan that everyone uh, can work towards and understand. So if I Madam, understand this right, you're asking Dr. Williams to start schools back March 1st for this motion. Dr. Williams, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. So as we discussed earlier, um, there was a, a question and it was answered that I would be coming back to the board, presenting a plan, um, outlining our different phases. But I also have to stress to the board that we are the third largest district school system and to compare us to Howard County and Hartford um, would not be the same since we are larger um, and we are still part of the recovery and repair of our ransomware. So I just want to remind the board what was shared earlier that a plan was coming forward um, and I, I just have to stress the comparison um, where we are not like those other districts. Um, my, I've also watched and looked at what they presented, and I would also say um, we should also look and see what's happening to the two largest school systems in, in Maryland. So uh, again, based on the conversation earlier about coming forth with a with a plan, with the phases, that was my work and what I had planned to do. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jones. And next, it looks like we have a question from Dr. Hager. Um, I just um, was looking at, at our current plan, which was approved on January 7th, and then Dr. Williams presented a plan last week, our Ready, Set, Go plan. Um, and so what what additional plans are you preparing for us, Dr. Williams, that are not currently outlined in, in those existing plans? So based on the question, Dr. Hager, it was a timeline, some specific dates. Um, that's what I thought the earlier question was. So what are those targeted dates in terms of moving uh, those phases, et cetera. And as we shared last time, shared out that timeline, a week here, two weeks, three weeks. So I, I thought the request was to then look at, given that timeline, what would that look like for Baltimore County Public Schools with some specific dates? Okay, okay, that, that was my question. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Rowe. So, I have a problem with this motion, mainly because the superintendent only just got the guidance from the state very recently that's going to change our plans. And we are recovering from a ransomware attack. And I feel like the use of the board's power to give the superintendent a directive over administrative functions of the school system, given that the guidance just came out and we're dealing with a lot of different variables, is premature. The board should refrain from giving the superintendent directives in situations where he's inclined to be doing the work anyway. And I would not like to insinuate that he somehow has to be forced to do what he's already doing. And I think that a directive is premature at this point. And I don't think that we have enough information to know if the dates for doing the phase in are even appropriate given the ransomware attack and everything. So I can't support this motion. Okay, and next we have Ms. Pastor. Thank you, I was just typing. Um, I, I, Ms. Rowe just said it. I think Dr. Williams uh, knows what needs to be done. He knows what the staff is doing. And I go back to my previous point. Um, and so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you, Ms. Scott. 
So I, I guess I'm looking for some clarity because my understanding based on our discussion tonight is Dr. Williams is clear uh, that March 1 is a deadline to have some students uh, in, you know, back in a classroom setting. So I don't quite understand, uh, Ms. Causey, um, you know, this just seems redundant at this point. Is, is there something that I'm missing? Please explain. Mr. Kuhn, I think it's important for the board to be clear, and I think it's important uh, to have smart goals. And I think uh, looking at the time that's needed to prepare for implementation um, is very, very important. And so that's why I am bringing this forward. The board had made a motion to uh, start sports, and then we um, hear at the beginning of this meeting that that's not going to happen. It wasn't even a point of discussion. Uh, it was just a statement, and now here we are, one whole week uh, lost in planning um, for that, and, and the board uh, does not agree that that um, is a constraint of the county executive um, order based on our plan having 20 um, or less students together. So I just want to have clarity. Um, I also want to make sure that uh, Dr. Williams is prepared and the staff is prepared and that at that meeting with the recommendation for board approval would uh, you know carefully lay out what's going to happen at that meeting uh, if there's a recommendation that he's bringing to the board and he doesn't think that it aligns with what i've stated then he can bring that recommendation to the board and inform us of why he's bringing a different recommendation but but that's my motion um i and I'm not making it based on uh, just what I think. I'm, I've listened to other counties' board meetings. I've listened to the state superintendent. Okay. Uh, I've uh, listened to Dr. Chan, Maryland's acting De deputy secretary of public health, okay. Dr. Fauci, American Academy of Pediatrics. So there's a Thank lot that has gone into Thank this. Thank you. We want to make sure that we get to everybody because uh, a lot of people have questions. It looks That's like Mr. Mahomes has, has a question. Mr. Yeah, yeah uh, I heard um, a couple of board members mention something about a week loss. Uh, what, were, what were they referring to? Are they referring to uh, the athletics or the reopening plan? I was just curious. Sir. They were referring to athletics and it was it, certain board members, not I, Ms. Causey said that the board feels differently. There are certain members that, that feel differently. So, um, yes. I know. Okay, I, that's what, like what I'm confused about a little bit because I, I, based on what I've been hearing from athletic uh, coaches and uh, students themselves, um, weren't didn't a plan didn't they begin um, uh, notifying their athletes beginning the applications? Oh, am I missing something? Did we not begin all that? So, Mr. Mahamza, if I may just respond, I think what the reference a week was was. Um, the concern that um, we're getting close to the date in which the board approved to have fall um, sports resume or to begin. So it was a, a week later from the last conversation. Again, I'm happy to provide an update um, to the board once I've uh, circled back with Mr. Sai and Dr. McComas. So, um while we wait for you to clarify uh, if we can begin February 13th, um, it or I guess what I'm looking for is like advice for our uh, athletic coaches. What are you? Or what are you going to tell them? Should they continue talking to the athletes, uh, acting, uh, uh, anticipating that we might open on February 13th? So, mean uh, continuing with their plans. Do you recommend that for our uh, coaches and staff? At this point, I would recommend it, but I would prefer, I would be much more comfortable having a conversation with Mr. Sai. I know he has done some work based on the motion that was made by the board. So I, I just need uh, just to have that conversation with him um, about those next steps. And as we shared, we I definitely will update the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Hager? 
Um, I was just going to comment that I have uh, I'm on the fence about this motion um, for the opposite reason of Lily. So when I heard her speak, um, my my brain is going in the opposite direction and that, like I said earlier, I, I think on Friday we're going to see metrics that look really positive. And if we are, you know, stuck and committed, not stuck, but committed to our, our original reopening plan, then that would mean we're ready to, to jump into the plan that Dr. Williams laid out for us last week and then we'd be ready to start a week earlier. And so if um, if it seems like given everything else that's happening, giving the school system that fourth week instead of just three weeks for the ready, set, go plan, um, and then would fall in line with Kathleen's motion, that then then that might make sense. But I really think we're, we're already ready to do this. And so putting a date on it, I do think, uh, like Ms. Causey said, would make families um, put a little bit at ease staff, teachers, knowing that there is a hard concrete date that we're reopening. Again, knowing that the metrics are going in the right direction. And, and Madam Chair, if I may respond again, that was what was asked of me to come back and provide those dates. So um, to Dr. Hager's point, that was, those were my next action. Um, looking at all the phases and what that would look like. So I just want to reference that. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it looks like Ms. Hen has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a few board members have pointed out that March 29th falls during spring break. So I would ask Mrs. Causey if she would consider an amendment to her motion to change the phase four date um, to a date of her, her choosing if she would um, modify her motion to either March 22nd or April 6th. Mad Madam Chair, Dr. Yes. Williams, allow the design team and I to, to come together and map out what that would look like and to bring it back to the board. As I shared earlier, I'm happy to bring back back to, to mm -hmm. the board, but let us look at all those logistics, uh, spring break. Again, I still have to work with our union folks, so um, let us come up with a plan that we can be able to present to the board, but now this just feels like we, we're getting into the operation. Is this clear? You want a timeline? You want dates? Allow us to do the work. Okay, and Dr. Williams, then hearing that and hearing members and everything, um, I would then make a motion that we postpone Ms. Calsey's motion um, until uh, to discuss perhaps at our February 9th meeting and um, revisit it then. Do so I have a Madam Chair, there's a motion on the floor and I asked Mrs. Causey if she would consider an amendment to her motion. So I believe we need to act on that first. Before the my motion to postpone the motion? Yes, ma'am. Is that correct, Mr. Brusades? My understanding is that the motion to postpone consideration takes precedence over the motion to amend so that it, the, the, that, the postponement would 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 go now. That's my understanding as well. So um second to again, the postponement. I'm sorry? Sec I second the postponement, Lily Rowe. Thank you. So Ms. Gover, if we could do a vote and we're voting on the motion to postpone the motion um, that Ms. Causey made to the February 9th meeting. Ms. Scott, can we read Ms. Causey's motion again, please? Uh, Ms. Causey, could you read your motion? Yes. Dr. Williams will bring a complete plan recommendation for board approval to implement the phases in the reopening plan as of January 7th on our website. Phase one and two start school on March 1, phase three on March 15th, and phase four on March 29th to the February 9th meeting. I was going to um, amend my motion to make phase four based on Dr. Williams' yes, recommendation, but, but that's not that's, have the opportunity to but do that's so. That's not what you said. So we're we're now we're processing the motion to postpone it to the February 9th meeting where it can be um, you can resubmit your motion and 
we'll have more time to read it and um, process it there. So Ms. Gober, could we do a, a roll call vote, please? On the motion to postpone. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahamza? Can you come back to me for a second? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Tastier? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? Uh, uh, no. Ms. Scott? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Mr. Mah Mr. Mahamza? Abstain. Favor of six. Okay, so the um, motion to postpone carries. And no, it, doesn't. it takes seven. No, it doesn't. It takes seven. No. Oh. The, the favor was six. So does it pass? So does the motion to postpone pass or not? No, no it failed. Oh, it fails. Okay. All right. So then, um, Ms. Colby, then I guess, are you going to restate your motion? I, my motion to amend is processed next, Madam Chair. That, that, that's correct. It's the Ms. Hens' motion to her changing the phase four date, I believe it was. Okay. Right. Well, so I was just asking if we could read it again because it's been a lot of motions that <laughs> have gone. So if you could read it again, um, Ms. Hen, as you wanted to amend it. Certainly, Madam Chair. Dr. Williams will bring a complete plan recommendation for board approval to implement the phases in the reopening plan as of January 7th on our website. Phase one and two start school on March 1, phase three on March 15th, and phase four on March 29th to the February 9th meeting. And as amended, I was going to move that we amend the phase four date to April 6th. I'll second that amendment. Okay, could we have the motion read as amended? Sure. Dr. Williams will bring a complete plan recommendation for board approval to implement the phases in the reopening plan as of January 7th on our website. Phase one and two start school on March 1st, phase three on March 15th, and phase four on April 6th. Yes to the February 9th meeting. Okay, and so now we will vote on the amendment. Can we comment? Excuse me? Uh, can we still comment on the motion? Well, I feel like there's been sure. commenting enough back and forth and it speaks for itself, so I feel that it's appropriate to take a vote. Ms. Gover? Madam Chair, can you clarify yeah. we're voting on the amendment? Yes, we are voting on the amendment, correct? Yeah. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Was that yes? I'm sorry. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Tester? Abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. And now if we could vote on the motion. 
itself. Ms. Ross? It's, thank you. No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is five. I'm sorry, you said favor of five? Fails. Yes, it failed. It fails, so the motion fails. Okay. All right, thank you for that. So um, we've had our discussion on the reopening of schools and the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next Excuse meeting- me, Madam Chair, I have a yes. question for Dr. Williams. Yes. So Dr. Williams, is it your intention to bring a plan to the February 9th meeting for the board's approval? Well, that's something, Dr. Williams, can you send us an email or an update to let us know um, when you will be presenting us with a plan? I um, recall him saying that he will present the board with a plan, but he did not give a date of February 9th, but I'm sure he can follow up with us in email. Um, is, does that sound feasible, Dr. Williams? Sure, and, and every open session, so on the February 9th, we will be prepared to provide an update. So that okay. that was what the board asked and we'll be happy to provide an update on February 9th. Thank you. So again, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held virtually on Tuesday, February 9th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. So thank you for joining us tonight and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Good night.